Alors, bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this meeting for the Standing Committee on uh, Public uh, Policies and Strategies. It's a meeting where we're, we have presentations, uh, opportunities for everyone to ask questions uh, at the appropriate times uh, on the different uh, various presentations. These are meetings that are open to the public and that also enable, uh, also offer opportunities for our, present, for our staff to make presentations as well as local organizations to, do, to uh, present, make presentations on various subjects that are then brought before the Municipal Council. Uh, in a, it's a form of more direct governance, in fact. This type, it's a type of meeting where there are, we don't make any decisions. There, are, there will be no resolutions on the part of the Council, but uh, it enables us to better understand and to, advance, to, move, to bring forward uh, uh, fi uh, files and, and uh, uh, to, before we proceed with the agenda, if some of you need interpretation in back, that you, there, are this, uh, there are devices for, trans for translation, for interpretation. Si quelqu'un a besoin uh, d'appareil pour uh, l'interprétation, ils sont au fond de la salle. So let's get right to it. Uh, so we're going to start with our presentation on the on the uh, downtown master plan. Stefan Dore from WSP, his whole team is here tonight. I don't know if somebody from Expansion Dieppe will be presenting this topic. If not, uh, uh, please uh, don't uh, don't fight over the mic. But uh, good night, good evening. So this evening. WSP will do a presentation on the master plan for a Dieppe's down, a downtown. We've, WSP has been working on this file for about nearly a year. So the person who will be doing the presentation this evening is Stefan Dore. He's part of uh, WSP's team in Gatineau. And Madame Anne Winters from WSP in Dartmouth. And John Hastiopoulos uh, from Toronto. From the, as you can see, we have a very team that uh, it draws uh, taking experience from uh, quite a few places. So they will present to what they've been working on. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, I really have to thank the 600 plus citizens and participants. Uh, uh, to the survey, actually, it was about actually nearly 700 people who answered this survey to help us um, in this uh, in this uh, for, to, to establish this plan. So, Mr. Dore, hello, every, everyone. Thank you for uh, for having us. Uh, uh, we, Mr. Jacques Leblanc, presented our team. And I'd like to, thank, to say hello to the audience as well. Our audience, Expansion Dieppe hired uh, WSP to make, do a master plan for the Dieppe's downtown. This uh, uh, master plan was done in two phases. I'm, I'm speaking in the past, but it's still not quite done. The first pay, phase con concerns a parking study on the southeast uh, quadrant of uh, the intersection of uh, Champlain and Acadie. Um, in which there were some rather specific parking problems. Uh, that study was completed in uh, summer of 2016. We took up the work again for the master plan uh, uh, with uh, d urban design uh, plans that were very well developed. Uh, with the, that was started at the end of 2016, and it went into 2017 until now. Uh, a master plan, why is it needed? Because Dieppe and its uh, downtown has experienced major growth since 2001, and also the council, the municipal council, and expansion Diep uh, uh, would like to have a document to help to in decision making. There we are. That's what I was indicating. The elements of why we need a master plan. 
Uh, so in terms of a, an overview of the project, I spoke of the two phases and the sector being studied. It's the uh, Dieppe's downtown. We're dividing it in four quadrants, um, limited uh, sort of between uh, the intersection of Champlain and Acadie to the east of Rue du Collège to the north, uh, uh, Rue Gold, and then south, uh, the, the river, I guess, uh, and to the west, uh, Champlain Mall. Uh, it's a dynamics uh, downtown in which we want to we want to do business. We want to continue to do business. We want to have fun. We want to live here, and the values that we're really pushing forward here. It's where you can walk a downtown where you can walk a, a well a connected downtown with links that's dynamic, that's living, that's uh, a viable. Uh, uh, economically viable and socially viable, uh, and environmentally friendly, cultural, and green. So in ter to, to do so, uh, the, st the work that we've done with the team of Expansion Dieppe and the members of the town of city of Dieppe, uh, the uh, city planning department especially, we, uh, we, we're proposing strategic orientations that are based on three, th three themes. Uh, traveling, getting around is one theme. Uh, also, living and working, and entertaining, entertainment. And uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, how can we easily travel to the, the downtown? Are there several ways to get there, to the uh, downtown uh, of Dieppe? Uh, if can we just do, we just need to drive there. Are there other ways to get there? Living and working. Well, we're asking questions. How do create a complete uh, uh, living environment where you, don't, where you don't just spend a little f moments here and there where you can really live there. And uh, entertainment, how does this, uh, how will this downtown be uh, attractive and enjoyable uh, so to spend some time in? So eight orientations, uh, or eight strategic orientations, first of all, first of all, in terms of uh, travel, getting around, uh, improving the experience of getting around, uh, especially in terms of architecture, uh, and uh, also in terms of incorporating uh, vegetation elements and comfort for uh, getting around, not only in the, by car, also on foot, so that all users can, uh, can, can find what they need there. So be able to incorporate elements of what we call uh, active transportation. So we're thinking of uh, all the types of uh, active transportation, like walking, for example, uh, and also bicycling, uh, and also uh, inline skating. So what are the best solutions to incorporate active transportation? Uh, how do we fill the void uh, that currently exists within the network uh, in terms of the pathways? Um, so incorporate active transportation, as you see in these images. It all, some of it already exists, but how can we improve the current situation and go a bit further? To improve? There's quite a bit of traffic elements already within the downtown and links. Uh, but how can we go further on this path? By uh, uh, creating a hierarchy for the uh, roadway network. What are the main uh, arteries and where are the secondary arteries? And complete uh, the, the, the pathway network, improve... Uh, uh, the facility as officers based on the, what the link is. Uh, for example, a more, a more local link that would uh, be able to connect the different spaces in the downtown, in Dieppe's downtown, and improve uh, the facilities uh, near uh, residential uh, buildings especially. Contribute to improving the uh, public transportation network of course, in, in the collaboration with uh, Kodiak Transport, improving accessibility, make uh, make it make transportation more efficient, 
to make it more uh, pleasant to uh, to use. Why why would we do uh, public transportation rather than a car? It should be more efficient. So cr uh, also a question of creating. Uh, a downtown that's on a human scale. It's it's already the, the, the case in Dieppe, but what can we do to continue on this path uh, in terms of arch arch architecture, um, work on the height of buildings, uh, their form, the volume of these buildings, the way that they're uh, laid out uh, to create a link with the, the street to ensure that uh, the the town is is pleasant, uh, not only for those uh, traveling by car, but also other users. So as you see in these images, uh, the way that the buildings are uh, l uh, presented to make it more uh, on a human scale, encouraging mixed uses um, by having commercial and residential uses in the same buildings or in the same uh, uh, areas. These are examples of buildings that share uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, f facilities uh, on the main floor uh, and residences in, in the residential areas uh, on the uh, first and second floors, second and third floors rather. Uh, another strategy is to create a an, an, uh, network of green spaces, open and distinctive. Um, this already exists in Dieppe, but we want to go further along this path. And how do, can we uh, meet all the needs of all, all, all the various clientele and all the types of use uh, and parks and green spaces. For example, a green space or a, or a park that could uh, be serving a residential area, it's not the same thing as a public area in the, in the center of the downtown. But how will it, but the, the downtown does include all, all types of use, including the residential use. So these are examples of parks that could be incorporated uh, throughout the urban uh, landscape and uh, in, in, in uh, Dieppe's downtown. And finally, connecting the downtown to the river to have better connections to the river, to be able to enjoy it again. Um, <coughs> especially uh, for recreation pur recreational purposes. So incorporate the uh, the uh, pathway network, uh, trails network, uh, make it more urban uh, to connect the plus 1604 to the Petakotiak River. So now I will pass the floor to my colleague John. He's a specialist in urban design and he will talk about the uh, transformational projects. First, uh, public. Uh, the uh, transformative uh, projects that were developed for, uh, for downtown Dieppe master plan were to illustrate the uh, strategic directions that Stefan already um, outlined and to make the, uh, to, to allow it to be understood in a clear sign, we broke down the area into five uh, specific uh, areas. One was uh, what we named uh, Champlain Street and Acadie Avenue corridors, the Petit Kodiak uh, Riverfront Park, Plas 1604 District, uh, Govan Road Block District, and the Downtown Shoulder District. So you will see them all outlined uh, in, in red are the corridors, in blue is Plas 1604 of course, uh, the Govan Block is in orange and the uh, shoulder areas are outlined in uh, yellow. These are all within the um, within the downtown uh, strategic core. Uh, speaking of uh, the uh, the rue, um, uh, speaking of Champlain Street and Acadie uh, Avenue corridors, uh, these corridors provide an opportunity to build upon the investment made by Dieppe in Plas 1604. And the mix of use growth uh, should be directed to these corridors in order to enhance the downtown core and to sort of develop uh, Champlain more as a main street in the short term. And the idea of uh, Acadie being uh, transformed into something similar that would feed on to uh, Champlain and uh, frame uh, Plas 1604 once the Paul Street uh, uh, diversion of, uh, of traffic uh, goes on to Paul Street. 
Uh, the idea is to direct growth and create pedestrian friendly scaled corridors along these streets. Uh, and the long, as I mentioned, the idea is to, to, to uh, transform um, uh, Champlain into this uh, more of a main street that has uh, the, those qualities. Uh, one of the things that we did talk about uh, previously was the uh, the uh, introduction of gateway elements and uh, the gateways that you see are, are, are visual cues that we provide through built form, landscape, public art, uh, and the, the idea is that one has arrived downtown. And we, in, in this slide, what we've shown uh, with the yellow circles are shown the, the entrances uh, to the downtown. And the idea would be that uh, with you could define uh, the intersection of Acadie and Champlain and at the uh, at college and Champlain with a built form and landscaping and then maybe at the at the top end that from the north side from uh, the uh, from the school and from the intergenerational complex you could do that through a combination of signage and um, and uh, landscaping again and then at the south end of the uh, of the study area on Acadie, uh, again, could be through a combination of signage, landscaping, could also be built form in the future. Uh, as part of these corridors, one of the things we have to look at are the features and what makes up these corridors. And, and so predominantly, we're looking at mixed use buildings, continuous street tree plantings, uh, wider sidewalks, articulated building walls, uh, canopies for weather protection, all these elements help build uh, these streets as being uh, important walkable uh, streets that, 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 are, that are main streets within the community. And to show, uh, to show sort of, uh, at one position where how the, the street section could work, we've shown uh, this section as a, as a relationship where we have three-story buildings on either side of the existing right-of-way that you see, but if you notice what we're showing is, as opposed to having the curb right up against uh, Champlain, uh, we still have kept the four lanes, but we're showing a buffer point, a, uh, the, the, the planted edge that you see there, the, the, where street trees would occur, where there would be furniture, where there could be uh, future parking, very similar to what you see in front, in front of us on Champlain right now. The idea is to extend that, that quality of space, but to ensure that we have these good, uh, wide uh, sidewalks that encourage pedestrian use. The second area we were looking at was uh, the potential for a, a, a riverfront park uh, uh, at uh, the Petit Kodiak. And uh, the idea is that it, it provides an opportunity to connect the downtown and the existing trail pass of the, of the riverfront. It also serves as a terminus uh, of a downtown pedestrian circuit that could be provided and uh, it, it provides a different program space to the southern portion of the downtown that doesn't exist now. So the idea was it would, it would pull, uh, you could potentially walk from uh, the uh, intergenerational complex, move south, come past Plastic 1604, move along Virginia and leading you to, uh, to the park itself. Uh, the idea is it would uh, include uh, active uh, transportation facilities. There'd be a central hub uh, within that park. Uh, there would be the, the creation of a natural um, uh, river flooding buffer that could be uh, developed as part of the uh, style of the of the riverfront edge uh, for the park. And uh, the, the, it would again. It would be that that connection, uh, sort of that end uh, point where you're moving from the downtown, uh, from Plast 1604, from that focus to the to the river's edge. Uh, these are just some images of, of, of some aspirational images of, of how we perceived uh, how the, uh, the 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 park could take shape and and have uh, have that feel. The uh, third. Uh, Area we looked at was Plast 1604, and there's already been a lot of obviously a lot of investment in in uh, and it doesn't really need uh, anything except uh, to be built upon to to be enhanced uh, by adding to it. And one of the things, because it is the center of uh, civic life, and uh, we thought, how, how could it be enhanced through the introduction of built form, uh, hard and soft landscape treatments, which already exist, but how can it be extended? 
uh, and the, how do we change portions of, of Govan that run through the Place? Because right now it splits it between north and south. So how do we treat it as a whole? And one of the things we were looking at was started to create these shared streets, these curbless roads uh, that prioritize pedestrians, cyclists, uh, while allowing access to automobiles throughout the year, but allows the closure of this part of Govan Road to, to serve as an event space over time. Because, you know, shared street spaces, they allow, you know, for the integration of that north and south edge. It has that continuity throughout the plaza. And by creating it as such through, um, I'm sorry, I went all the way through these. By creating, um, I'm getting to, By creating these uh, these areas with curbless uh, edges, it still allows uh, cars to move through, but you can close these off at certain times where you're having festivals or events. Uh, traffic can still move, move around at the, at the edges, but this allows uh, an extension of the marketplace during certain events. It allows for other events to occur. During the regular part of the year, you would define the different uses through decorative paving. And it's been shown in other applications where these are used, uh, which you can sort of see in one of the bottom images, it starts to slow down traffic. And this is an area that has a concentration of, of pedestrian activity where we see it being a civic focus. Uh, the fourth location we were looking at was the uh, Govan Development Block, or we named the Govan Development Block, which is the area east of, uh, of the uh, Plast 1604. And this is Great because it introduces key principles and demonstrates key recommended directions that we have in general in the report. And the conceptual plan, if, 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 uh, if you're looking at the, uh, this image, uh, introduces a, a few elements. So there's a, a new north-south road uh, for more sc pedestrian scale block lengths. Because when you look at the extent from, uh, from Marche to College, you've got 400 meters, which is a very long block. And it's fine for vehicles, but it's not fine for pedestrians. And uh, noting that we also didn't have enough north-south uh, uh, travel uh, in terms for pedestrian ease, uh, that was one of the things where we were trying to introduce uh, a new road. That new road also allows us to introduce uh, a, a smaller uh, scaled parquet, which is something that could be used immediately by not only the existing residential areas to the south of, uh, on the south side of Govan, but what we're showing as, uh, as residential areas on the uh, north side. Uh, it includes uh, uh, you know, gateways at uh, College and, uh, and Champlain. Uh, you can see sort of the, the, the building that has this articulation at the corner. Uh, the apartment residential along the south that relates to the apartments opposite on the Govan on the south side. Uh, the the, the, one of the key ideas behind the, the development of this was to uh, push the parking areas either behind buildings or in central courts behind, uh, behind the buildings themselves so that we don't have these interrupted edges along. If, if Champlain is going to be this main street over time, having continuous um, uh, driveways that interrupt the, that flow, the pedestrian uh, flow along those edges will compromise the idea of a main street. So we were looking at showing how you could introduce uh, access from uh, side streets uh, on either side and through uh, the, the new road that we were, um, that we were noting. It also includes uh, a structured parking idea, which is very, very close. It's, it's sort of the large mass. I don't know if I can, how I can show it with the, so where we're showing. some of the uh, a future uh, parking uh, structure that could be three stories and again could be treated as an element. So the, the idea is that along this edge, we have mixed use development along these edges, which could include uh, retail, it's always retail based, but could include either office or residential above. And then we have along the extension of college and all along Govan up to a certain point, we have uh, the relationship that matches the residential. So those are all envisioned to be apartment buildings. In the center, again, as I mentioned, there's the, the, the new park and the new road uh, that's introduced. And the idea here, again, is if you know, we're facing all the buildings onto the parquet, onto the street, the idea is to always create this safe, 
comfortable um, uh, pedestrian friendly space. Oh, how do I erase that? Oh, there we go. Uh, and this is just giving you images of of the um, of 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 uh, the con uh, the conceptual uh, uh, rendering that we had. The view that you see on the bottom is sort of how we can create that gateway at uh, at, at College and Champlain, and how you you can also get a sense of the um, uh, the parking that's within. Part of the whole idea of uh, here's the parquet. Uh, we're showing the. Uh, residential apartment buildings and sort of the scales that we were looking at in terms of heights and, and how it could be treated. And part of the other quality of, of Govan was if this was to happen along the north side of that block, uh, on the north side of Govan, how could that block further enhance, again, that pedestrian experience from east to west? And what you see here is uh, the existing south side that you see here, which is ha remains the same in our concept. But we're including both, on both sides, a cycling uh, lane. But most importantly, we're creating this new buffer of tree planting on one side, that's between the uh, uh, Govan and uh, uh, an enhanced sidewalk where you see a, a 1.8 meter sidewalk. The reason I show this is one of the things it would require is that if, as you're looking at developing that side of Govan, it would require a bit of an encroachment into uh, the property lines as they are now in order to be able to realize this idea of a continuous planted, uh, planted edge along, uh, along Govan. Uh, the final area were uh, the downtown shoulder areas. Now this is, it was significant for us to talk about this because we saw the, uh, the downtown shoulder areas as, as a predominantly residential area. We know that these areas have other activities that over time there's been sort of this organic sort of change in some of these places. But in terms of how we were looking at the overall downtown study area, we were trying to understand where, uh, where certain development and certain uses could be focused and where uh, other uses could, could occur as well. Because if you're trying to do everything all in the same area, we're going to be spreading, uh, spreading a lot of the activity too thinly. So if we're going to focus and create these main streets, these corridors, enhance the way we treat the areas around 1604, there has to be some concentration of, of, of development. Um, they're not envisioned to be, uh, uh, oops, sorry. They're not envisioned to be a large growth areas, but we do still know that there's a lot of development that still occurs there that could be construed as, as uh, mixed use. Uh, the other important thing is, uh, as we talked earlier, one of the things we're, 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 we're most concerned about with these north south because they are only about 400 meters away from, the, from Champlain at either end, uh, which is a good walkable distance, what we call a five minute walk. The problem, however, is there aren't enough north south connections. So, uh, you'll see in, in, the, in the report, we talk about a lot of opportunities to create not just new road connections, but the idea of creating new mid-block connections, which could be pedestrian and cycling only, or looking for other opportunities where we could create more connections to the north. Thank you. Merci. Alors, bonsoir, Monsieur le maire, le conseil et les membres du public. Avec ces déductions stratégiques que Stéphane a mentionné, et ça a été mentionné dans les... ...policy recommendations, and we've categorized them under each of the eight strategic directions that Stéphane had reviewed. Um, so the first one, for enhance the right-of-way, uh, we recommend that levels of safety and comfort for pedestrians are kept within the right-of-way uh, by... Um, separating different transportation modes, so separating the pedestrians from the cyclists from the uh, moving traffic. And we also recommend future policies to ensure the right-of-way are maintained for comfort and aesthetic values. Uh, for integrating active, transport active transportation, uh, we recommend to look to create a complete and seamless active transportation network for pedestrians and cyclists um, that create connections throughout the downtown study area as well as uh, integrated into the recreational trail system surrounding it. For improving connection and circulation within the area, we're recommending to make sure we break up those large uh, block systems by um, connecting off-road and um, and multi-use trails, particularly with. Uh, uh, 
voies cyclables. By implementing these mid-block connections, we're really creating a downtown area that is more walkable and um, offers a, a greater level of porosity. Uh, for improving the public transit network, we're encouraging placement of higher density residential and commercial development along de dedicated transit routes um, to minimize the reliance on private automobiles with, for residents in the area. Uh, we are also recommending to look to investigate and um, to look to upgrade existing transit structures, so providing sheltered uh, bus stops uh, for for transit us users. Um, human scale built form. Our recommendation is to follow for all new development and construction to keep in line with the uh, urban design guidelines that have been attached to our master plan. And uh, for mixed, mix, to encourage a mix of land uses, to continue to encourage in all commercial zones, residential land uses along with commercial um, in order to establish a complete and vibrant live work environment. Uh, the seventh category of recommendations or is under the strategic direction is to um, is to ensure that some sort of park or open space is available for all areas in the downtown and that uh, we respect the 400 meter walking distance for every resident to be able to reach a park and open space which is really a reasonable distance for um, most residents to to expect to walk to um, we also recommend to ensure that there's a mix of structured and unstructured recreation opportunities within the downtown to um, allow for passive and, and active rec recreation. And the final set of recommendation is connection to the river. So to make sure we that council secures land and funding for the creation of that future riverfront park. Um, and as well as to create physical and visual connections from the study area from Plast 1604 that will bring users to the Petticodiac River. So some financial investment and incentive recommendations. Uh, we suggest to continue to prepare annual reports measuring economic development, population growth, as well as to keep track of construction indicators. Um, we're also suggesting to undertake further research on the effects of the municipal tax rate, uh, property values, access to transit, zoning regulations, um, what those effects have had on development in the area and how does it compare to surrounding land areas in the suburban or industrial um, adjacent land uses. Uh, we also suggest to uh, implement the recommendations found in our phase one study for the um, downtown parking area, which will support local businesses uh, while minimizing public investment in parking infrastructure. Uh, on that note, we suggest undertaking a feasibility study specifically related uh, to the construction of the multi-level uh, parking structure, which I, to my understanding is already being looked at. Um, we, we recommend undertaking or adding on to the existing parks master plan and consider uh, when considering looking into the riverfront park or, or implementing those parkettes that um, I believe Stefan had, had gone through. Uh, and finally, we suggest spending some, ta some time to determine what level of revenue generated in the downtown can be further uh, invested into, into public benefit and what are the cost benefits benefits or risks or rewards associated with these methods. So the city of Dieppe has already taken a number of steps to create efficient management and economic development framework in the municipality, uh, such as the creation of expansion Dieppe. <clears throat> Given the city's central location in the Maritimes and the population growth trends it has been experiencing, the city's really well positioned to have one of the stronger, um, well, higher performing economic sectors in the region. An, imp an important consideration going forward though is to um, figure out how to strike a balance between the surrounding land uses and the downtown area. So how will, how will Dieppe leverage the land uses we see in Champlain Mall or the big box highway commercial areas or the industrial, the, the industrial areas um, to really um, establish itself as, a, as an active and vibrant downtown? Uh, so we are suggesting that downtown Dieppe look to attract small and medium-sized local and world-class retailers and begin to identify itself as a downtown where people want to live, visit, and, and be inspired in. So to support existing and future businesses, a future step that 
that we recommend council take is to establish a downtown business association uh, to establish a group that would advocate on behalf of the local business community to ensure that their, their um, priorities are in alignment with the direction that, that council and expansion DF takes. Le plan directeur comprend également une série de recommandations que je vais vous résumer ici. Euh, tout d'abord, des recommandations oui, concernant oui. l'amélioration. Euh, 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 essentiellement, euh, des, euh, des recommandations d'intégration des lignes directrices de design urbain, euh, comment les mettre en œuvre via la modification euh, euh, d'arrêté de, de zonage. In terms of zoning, we want to make, uh, under implement those guidelines and uh, through studies that are more uh, focused on the urban landscape and also recommendations to integrate uh, active transportation notably as we've mentioned uh, the ways to create links uh, for uh, additional uh, active transport to improve the uh, traffic and the links uh, setting up a pilot project for the western part of Gauvin to make it uh, a street that's uh, uh, shared between uh, motorized transport and also uh, pedestrian, or as has been done just for pedestrians elsewhere in Canada. To improve the uh, public transport system uh, by improving the stops, as we mentioned as well, optimize uh, the service in public uh, transportation. to build at the human scale to limit the uh, scale and uh, the density of, of the future developments to make sure that we avoid uh, focusing uh, on some projects only. We may have seen this in the past uh, to build at the human scale. I have mentioned before to increase uh, mix uh, usages uh, to make sure to do some market studies on this issue and maybe not to force it, but to see where it's potentially viable. To create uh, a network of green spaces and open spaces uh, to, uh, to establish uh, better practices for park uh, management uh, uh, improve the parks where necessary and uh, perhaps determine the new uh, parks. Uh, also to connect with the river uh, as was mentioned by improving the, uh, be the uh, link between uh, place 1604 and the river through Virginia Avenue and to set up a management plan uh, for this sector that we've uh, set up uh, and have you been able to see uh, uh, a riverside uh, park along the Petticodiac. So I'll, I'll ask John to come back. Uh, so he'll give us, uh, I guess it's the Francais. Well, I'll try to make this very quick. Uh, the best way of understanding the urban design guidelines is they are a help to uh, the city and staff in which to implement uh, the ideas and some of the directions that we've already given. Uh, the best way to describe it is we break down the guidelines going from large scale, so the public realm and the private realm, moving all the way down to the building typologies and the built types of built form. And then the third scale is at the, the, most, uh, at, at the most direct way, which is uh, at ground level, the retail uh, area, how uh, materials and colors and street, and uh, in the case of retail store frontages would work. Uh, public realm, when we talk about public realm, we're uh, talking about uh, 
everything that is uh, outside, I guess, of the pro of private property line. So it includes the road right of ways, it includes the the sidewalks and streets, includes park spaces, it includes uh, those elements that are, are are not within private property. The private with the private realm. We're talking about built form, and uh, which includes uh, general guidelines for all the different types of uh, uh, built form that could occur uh, within it, including uh, everything from mixed use to various forms of residential, including low-rise apartment buildings down to single detached. Uh, as part of that, as part of the um, uh, going from the the private realm in terms of looking at built form types and the uh, and the topologies, building topologies, we've provided guidelines that talk about uh, things that we've, I've already mentioned in some of the demonstrations, which is gateways, you know, how does mixed use work, uh, what's the uh, range of residential. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see there's even how do we deal with structured parking where we've got uh, retail at base and structured parking is behind it and above it. Uh, in, in this particular slide, uh, we're, we're showing, again, different ways of how we can get to gateways and uh, the idea of having added height at corners or having special treatments at the corners. Uh, then we're going down to the next scale, which are the, the, the building facades. So the building facades, again, we're, we're looking at what are appropriate heights between the other side of, uh, of, of the uh, of a canopy to to the street. What are appropriate heights of gra at grade level retail? So we talk about things such as 4.5 meters being an ideal height, because there's a lot of a flexibility in how that space could be used. Different types of retail restaurants, other things can can use that space in a different way, as opposed to maybe having residential floors above it that are three store uh, that are three meters uh, in height. Uh, I guess. So, uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to, to mention, I guess a couple of the slides here are, are missing, but it's how we also provide guidelines right down to the types of materials uh, and, 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 de and details that we're using. So the idea of ensuring that along the building facades, if we're trying to create these great main streets and we're trying to create Champlain something special as an example, you know, uh, what are what are sort of the the, the, the conditions for uh, the size of the signage? Where the signage should go? If there are canopies, what percentage of that canopy should be taken up? So we've gone from the very broad. I guess what I what, where I want to end is we've gone from the very broad where we talk about the big picture of the private of the public realm, then down to the private realm, then speaking to the types of buildings and the guidelines that go along with them, all the way down to how we deal with uh, street frontages. Thank you. Donc pour conclure, uh, on résume la mise en œuvre. So to conclude, uh, uh, we've observed the recommendations. First of all, to obtain the approval of the municipal council in terms of guidelines and the uh, master plan report. Secondly, to assess the options to implement and undertake, uh, follow those uh, directives, modify the urban management plan and bylaws to incorporate uh, the main uh, guidelines of the master plan. I want to thank you. There are a lot of elements uh, there and we've taken quite some time. I hope you will uh, understand for us. I would uh, suggest uh, we take another four minutes to watch the video that we've uh, set up with a potential uh, concept, uh, but it'll give you some idea to conclude their presentation.
Alors, merci. Euh, je pense qu'il y aura peut-être des questions. Thank you. I think there may be some questions. Let's start off with uh, Councillor Godet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, John, in your presentation, when you were talking about the Northwest Quadrant, you've lumped it into a sh you call it a shoulder, 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 downtown shoulder. Yes. That area that's between Acadie and Paul Street, sloping downhill, going towards the yes. Hall, if I understood you earlier, you said that we should continue or we should encourage mixed residential there. Presently, what's happening in that area is either commercial development is going in there, houses are being taken over by commercial businesses, or there are large apartments or medium apartments going in there. Are you suggesting that we should also encourage residential uh, development in that area? Because I think that's probably one of the second fastest growing areas in terms of commercial development in Dieppe, if you look at the potential of it being close to the mall and being close to other commercial establishments. And, and, and mm -hmm. some of the themes that we even talked about a long time ago was the idea of setting up sort of a, a European style uh, area where you would have boutiques there and uh, very specialty kinds of things where people can leave the mall and then go up into these streets and look at very small restaurants and stuff like that. What's your, uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it, that, that's, uh, it's, it, that was one of the difficult areas to, to, to deal with from the perspective that when you're trying to develop uh, a, different, a different experience from what the mall does, uh, you know, when you have a mall, you have a, you have a building that is uh, sitting within a sea of parking. So the idea that you're gonna get through the sea of parking and then cross Paul Street to be able to get is is actually, you might drive there, but you're not going to walk there. It's not it's not going to be that that experience. Nobody's going to because they've driven to the mall to begin with. I think what we were trying to do is we were looking at how the city had already uh, done its part in terms of um, investing into Plast 1604, developing uh, the areas around it. There are all these amenities uh, for most in urban design. Uh, you have to have multiple amenities, uh, multiple things for people to do, then it starts to create a place, a center. And that's how you start to focus. So we were thinking if all this work had already gone into that, uh, we're not gonna compete with the mall, with the idea that the mall has a different experience. The way of dealing with that is you're not competing with it. What you're doing is you're providing a different experience along Champlain. This is already, there, there's a reason to, uh, you go to Plast 604, you take in an event, you're in the summer, and then there's a place to go to adjacent that you can go for dinner, a drink, I don't coffee, whatever whatever it is, but that experience has to has to exist there. That's not gonna be this, the mall's not gonna provide that experience, it's just not possible. So when you talk about the Northwest area, when I look at Acadie, uh, yeah, that's a very organic area. It's, it's, uh, it's changed uh, and, and, and there are different things going on there. And that, that's one of the questions that we received when we were doing the work and um, you know, how are you dealing with that? We're not excluding that. If that's gonna happen organically, we're saying that's fine. What we're, what we're more saying is, if we can direct growth onto for mixed use retail with commercial or retail with residential, we should start looking at that specifically uh, south of Champlain and Acadie and, and, and along Champlain. But I think in the short term, we're thinking more Champlain in the long term Acadie. If Acadie north of Champlain develops, that's, we're not against that. We don't think that that's fine. But it, it, what I always get worried about when we're in smaller municipalities is that we need to focus some of that development and some of that attention so we get some critical mass in the center so that it, it starts and then it blossoms from that. And that's what I'm trying to say. You've already planted the seed and we need others to do their part and to develop uh, adjacent to it. So that's a, we weren't so much as criticized that but as saying this is what, what we really should be doing. I hope I've answered. Yeah, it's just, it's just that the trend now seems to be going, whether we like it or not, it seems to be going Conseiller Godet, si vous voulez vous rapprocher un peu de votre micro parce qu'on ne vous entend pas. Conseiller Godet, si vous voulez vous rapprocher de votre micro parce qu'on ne vous entend pas. Conseiller Godet, si vous voulez vous rapprocher un peu de votre micro parce qu'on ne vous entend pas. Conseiller Godet, si vous voulez vous rapprocher un peu de votre micro parce qu'on ne vous entend pas. Conseiller Godet, si vous voulez vous rapprocher un peu de votre micro parce qu'on ne vous entend pas. 
Well, it, it's already, I, I think what I'm, I think probably what I would say more so is that I, you know, personally, I, after looking at, and, and going through the study and looking at all the recommendations that we've made is wherever possible, uh, development should be directed to Champlain, uh, that type of development, because on paper and in plan, it looks great. You put the the multi-unit residential across the street from from the uh, from the shopping mall, but it doesn't work in the sense that you're not going to get the pedestrian activity because that's uh, people Im immediately think, well, then we can get pedestrians crossing because it's it's a it's a busy road. It's it's uh, it's a different experience. What I'm trying to say is, the mall is there and people will travel to the mall uh, the same way as they always have. On this side of Paul Street, how do you how do you get uh, that area to to function a certain way? How do you make sure that from those shoulder areas are multiple opportunities to make your way to Champlain, to make your way to 1604 without a car? Because in in uh, although we didn't get too many people to come out during the January uh, when we had the public uh, consultation because of the terrible weather, but uh, the, the the people that did show up talked about having alternatives to get to uh, Plast 1604 by foot. Because right now the blocks are quite long, there aren't enough breaks. So that's the thing we're always dealing with when we're uh, dealing with communities where uh, you're transitioning from a very car-based. Uh, we're never gonna get rid of that, but we're, we, we, th what I mean by car-based is I mean the structure of the community. Like they're very long blocks that need to be broken up so that people feel that they don't have to walk this long circuit to get to where they wanna be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Councillor uh, Alain. John? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation, first of all. Uh, there's some great uh, actually caveats that you guys talked about. Surprisingly, uh, I really like the gateway concept. That's something I think is lacking uh, here in our area. The Probably one of the most uh, positive is the connection back to our river, I think that's something we've definitely lost and we have to come back, we got to bring it back. There's, you talked about experience and what definitely def defines downtowns is authenticity. So we have Plus Saint-Sancat, we've invested heavily in Saint-Sancat actually. What's, what's our Eiffel Tower? What's our American Pierce? What's our, what's something that we could, uh, distinguish ourselves to other downtowns across Canada, for example, that's one. Uh, to echo the comments of my, uh, my colleague, um, what I think is missing, or it's people. Downtowns are about people, and I think uh, our sister city uh, next door to us has a challenge of attracting people downtown, and I think on a in the near future, people want to come downtown, so we have to uh, provide more opportunities for, I think, people to come and live downtown. That's uh, point, my point number two. And my point number three is, uh, again, to CF Champlain. Who says that CF Champlain is going to be there for the next 50 years? Why can we build condos in the parking lot and maybe eventually? It, it's that, t that, type of that type of vision that we want to go. So... Like I said, uh, we've got Plessa Sankat, we're connecting back to ourselves to the river. What's our Eiffel Tower? Is it maybe, the, it, it, the river is certainly a component. So how do we, and it's all about people, and you talked about authenticity and experience. And we're selling Dieppe, the mayor's been selling Dieppe today. We had a great state of the city. We have a, a, a new vision for our city, we have a, Maybe something, another, something that we could have talked about is the link between our new urban quarter, because we have a new urban quarter where we're going to have, we have a school, we have a community college, and we're going to have this great sports uh, theme infrastructure, Inter intergenerational sports infrastructure. I see. So how do we get that done? So that's my two cents worth. That's a lot to unpack. Come on, I, come on, I get those all the time. I think, <laughs> I, I, think, I think that the whole premise of what we've talked about, that's why I talked about not spreading too thin. Mm. Right? Because when, when we're, everything that we've talked about is all about 
how do you get the people who are already living within 400 meters of Champlain, how do you get them to actively come through the city and, and, and come to the center? And then through mixed use and by directing, why is this thing here? <laughs> oh, it's you. Sorry, uh, it's, it, um, and the other is by introducing uh, a critical mass of people within the core. And it, it can't all get done all at the same time. If, if development gets directed at all sorts of uh, quarters without trying to concentrate it, you know, when, when you've got, uh, although Dieppe has grown so much in 15 years, it, you still have to direct that growth. It still has to go in certain areas or else you're going to get a very spread out and you're going to get people doing different things everywhere. And you're going to have, uh, eventually you will also have, you know, a resident saying, why is this happening here? Why isn't this more closer to a plus 1604? Why isn't this on Champlain? Like, why did you, how did this make its way up here? Uh, because there has to be this idea that, that when you move through a, a, through a downtown core that there's some hierarchy and you move from one area to the other. What we were trying to do with this plan is, because it's very hard to do this in 30 minutes and, and try and explain all the work that was done. Uh, one, build on, the, uh, on what's already been invested. Two, was now, now the intergenerational complex that we talked about. So one of the things that we talked about was, how do we connect that? How do you link up all the, all the elements, all the civic institutional elements? So going from the school and, uh, and the intergenerational complex with a gateway there, that leads you down that street. That's where that street gets that enhanced streetscape so that it suggests you know that you're on this special street. It's got, I don't know, it maybe has double row trees, special planting, special uh, paving, but that you know that you're on the street that's going to lead you down to Marche, past 1604 or around it, and out to Petigodiac uh, River. I mean, to me, that, the idea of that narrative of walking through that story is, is wonderful because it's, it's a, it's a one-kilometer walk. And the reality is one kilometer is, are, is about 12 to 15 minutes. For those who walk very slowly, maybe 20 minutes. 20 minutes is not a long walk, but if you know that at each couple of hundred meters that you're going to be encountering something, an element, a special building, a special square, and that you're going to be encouraged to do that by enhancing that streetscape, you're going to make it, you're not going to put a curb right next to a street where people move very quickly, but you will have, you'll still have that street, You'll have that tree and planted zone. John, I, uh, don't, I hate to interrupt you, but yeah. if you're going to go on, please speak into the microphone oh, because we have, we have thousands sorry. of people listening I'm in sorry. on the web, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I know we all get excited when we talk about development. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but, but th that was a key element. That, that, that was, you cannot get um, uh, an active and vibrant downtown if you don't have people there. And I know everybody talks about, oh, bring mixed use, but one of the things we're also talking about is you have to create the, um, the conditions that make people want to walk along there. And that's why you'll see we talk about how do we improve the streetscape on a commercial retail street, such as how Champlain is envisioned. How do we deal with a more residential street that you bring residents along, like Govan is envisioned, uh, the way that we've portrayed it? Uh, what does that mean? So the, the idea is that if you create this great uh, street with a row of uh, street trees on Govan on the north side, was the example I gave, and it leads you into this shared street within Plastic 1604, you know, it takes you right by what could be potentially an area where there's uh, structured parking. These are all elements that start to explain why you should live downtown and, you know, the, the, the fact that there are these amenities and that you're making these great connections to them. Of the buildings that are there right now, we take a snapshot of the buildings there right now. So you're a designer, an expert. Are we, I feel they're nice buildings. Mm -hmm. Are we on the right path? Is the buildings where? The existing buildings today, like the, the on Govan? Our landscape, yeah. Yeah, the, on the, Govan, Marche, like are we on the right path? Yeah, I, 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 th I think it is. I think the, it's elements that don't work. You see, because a lot of times we, we can't say, well, we're going to have a three story building that's, that's, uh, that's uh, pedestrian friendly and human scaled, and it is. But what are the elements that are missing? If you don't face the building onto the street with its main entrance and you're You've got the side of the building that nobody actually looks out of. It's not as, as nice of an experience if you're the pedestrian. It doesn't have that passive security of people looking out on the street. When you're on Champlain, if, 
Champlain is continuously interrupted with driveways to everybody leading to their individual parking areas for their commercial or for their retail, that starts to uh, disintegrate that experience, the pedestrian experience. And what you end up doing is you have multiple driveways. And I don't think anybody thinks that's a, that's a pretty thing to, to, to walk down. And why would, you, why would the municipality want to invest uh, in a streetscape where it's going to be continuously interrupted? I see in your recommendations you don't talk about any tax abatement program as an incentive for, your, uh, for development. That's, that's for other people. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can you repeat the question? A tax so, tax abatement programs. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they're, there's, they're pretty much all in every down, big downtown uh, uh, inner cities across Canada. Uh, here in New Brunswick, we really haven't touched tax abatement programs as an incentive for developers to start developing our downtowns or uh, residential or heritage sites. Mm -hmm. Is there something? It wasn't that wasn't in your. Uh, it wasn't part recommendations. of our recommendations. Yeah. So yeah, and I just guess, wondering why. Well, I guess that to, to that end, that would be more of an economic development study, and it, it was a bit out of the scope of what we were looking at. Um, and really, we're, it's not to say that it wouldn't work because it has worked in many municipalities. This wasn't part of your scope. It just wasn't part of our scope, but it should certainly be something that could be considered to encourage the types of development that that have been outlined in our plan. So. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Alain. When we speak of reducing taxes, uh, we may be able to do that next year once the Municipals, Municipalities Act, uh, the change, the Modified Municipalities Act will be in place. It may be another vehicle for that. Councillor Nolan. Thank you very much for your presentation, I think it, it speaks volumes as to the vision that we have as a city moving forward and as, as new generations come into our area um, and, and want to live, uh, basically live, work and play in the same area and not have to uh, get in your car and drive 15, 20 minutes to go to work uh, in, another part of, in another part of town uh, or live in another part of town to come in to the downtown area to work. Um, I think it's an absolutely fantastic um, concept that we have. I think that uh, our, our people at, at Expansion Yep, our, our staff is, is outstanding and, and, and looking ahead uh, going with such a study. Um, I think the, the video is an awesome marketing tool that we can use to kind of sell to uh, future investors uh, in our community. And I really like the idea of kind of creating a uh, a kind of a focus group from your downtown or, or business owners from within the core uh, because they're the people that are going to be investing in our area and, and evidently they're the people with the money so they they make those investments, right? Um, and I, I love the, the more European feel uh, that we're going kind of like a, a mini Amsterdam kind of kind of concept or a London uh, concept where you can go from a to Z in, 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 in one shot. So thank you very much for, for the work you guys do, uh, or the work you guys did uh, for us. Um, and I think, and, and maybe a question more towards our staff, so I'll switch to French. Mais est-ce que... No, pardon, no. Would, should we, should you as an organization focus your efforts more on the downtown rather than the three sectors that we have or should we invest more as a municipality in you, uh, in this downtown, so that we can see these projects come to fruition more, more quickly? Thank you, Councillor, for the question. Uh, to, in fact, uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic development, uh, it, uh, it needs long-term planning to, to work properly. That has to happen in sectors where there are possibilities for development. For example, as the as the consultants indicated, there's sectors where there's major investments that have been done, and we have to capitalize on investments that have been done on the public sector to attract private sector investment. It, it comes into the equation uh, for the municipality. There's no question of cutting the se sector to the detriment of another if there's investments that's been done. In the downtown sector, there's been investment. There's been major development 
done on uh, Dieppe Boulevard is going to happen with the new school. That whole sector deserves uh, continued planning to ensure uh, private investors that we have plans, that we know what we have, we know where we're going, we have a vision so that they feel comfortable uh, with the investments that we have because they know what's coming down the pipe. And uh, same thing for the industrial park. It's a slightly different uh, area. We were trying to make lots available at a good cost so that entrepreneurs can uh, can set up and incubate and uh, their businesses uh, at home. That's all I have to say, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I don't see any more questions, Madam Arsenault. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to simply say that Lik Richard has already given us a presentation and in terms of how he's been helping us develop our public transportation system in Dieppe, or transportation system rather in Dieppe. It, will the transportation system go through most of the town uh, in the sections where there's greater population? And so a lot of people will be served. What I'm also interested in is we'll have, uh, we'll have shelters, this type of protection for people uh, waiting for public transportation? Is this going to be built everywhere, all throughout town? I don't know if Luke is here, in fact. Mr. Richard, Mr. Richard. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Madam Councillor. It's certain, certainly with the new downtown plan, it's gonna require uh, for us to uh, revise our, review our, uh, our, our public transportation plan with the new uh, streets, we're gonna need some new uh, circuits. Uh, we're going to need to uh, figure out where uh, a strategy for establishing uh, bus shelters. There's nothing established just yet. Uh, the staff that's been working with the consultants, uh, those elements were raised. So at some point it will be part of the planning. Thank you. That's great. It's good to know. Mr. Mayor. Uh, John mentioned it, uh, the canopy P's were probably going to be five feet from from the ground rather than three feet, five meters rather, rather than three meters, to make it for able to have people who have businesses to be able to have bistros or more space. Uh, I'm listening, I'm embarrassed. I should I should know exactly what you're saying, but uh, uh, no. Uh, you're, what you're, I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is you were mentioning difference between three meters and five meters for the canopies? Oh, no, no, what, what we were talking about is, because um, uh, I was trying to finish the presentation, in the guidelines, we've even gone down to the details of talking what the height should be between uh, canopies and, and, and at ground level. So in the guidelines, uh, we typically say it should be around 2.7 meters from the underside of the canopy to uh, the street. The 4.5 meters, five meters uh, height is for the ground level height of the story. So the idea is that if we talk about mixed use development, um, then what we want to ensure is that at, at grade, we have a story that is very flexible because three meters is too low. Uh, you start to limit the types of retail that you can have. And uh, that's why we always, it's, it's a standard. It can be higher than that. But one of the standards that we, that we see in a lot of communities is to introduce a 4.5 meter height for the first story. And it allows a range of activity. It could be bistros, it could be uh, uh, clothing stores, it could be all sorts of different things. But the idea is that it gives flexibility, where if we only had three and a half meters, you may only be uh, able to have certain types of business functions. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame Arsenault. Uh, je ne veux pas restreindre la discussion. I don't want to... Uh, to uh, I think it's a topic that we're all uh, passionate about uh, when we talk about uh, our, uh, our community and uh, specifically the... Uh, downtown development uh, as uh, the community continues to grow, um, but we've already exceeded by a few minutes, uh, and I would like to get some kind of feedback from, uh, from the people in the crowd. So for people with us who have come with the intent uh, to listen to the presentation about this development uh, of our downtown and that might want 
to ask questions uh, to the consultants. I would invite you to, to do it now. We'll open the floor uh, for discussion. I also know that there's uh, an, an intention to, uh, there'll be here in the lobby, there'll be also uh, space and time to ask uh, questions there. But if you have more general and uh, conceptual uh, questions, then uh, don't uh, hesitate. So it's uh, counting down. So mine was. So, okay then. Uh, so thank you. We'll, uh, uh, we will be uh, uh, sponging up, absorbing uh, the information in greater detail as we move forward with, uh, with our downtown development. Uh, um, lots of good stuff. Lots of good things, particularly when we talk about linking uh, our downtown with our river. It's been it's been a, a topic of con a conversa conversation for many of us uh, around this table, and uh, we look forward to uh, to see what uh, staff will bring back in terms of uh, recommendations to move forward to the river. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Alors, maintenant, prochain item. So thank you, the next item, and I'll find my agenda here. So the uh, Heritage, uh, Acadian Historical Heritage Guide, and that's by Mr. Sawa. Good evening. So good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, councillors. Uh, my name is Paul Savoy, I'm a member of the uh, steering committee of the FAFA uh, Federation. Uh, here we want to present uh, the project of creating a historical guide, uh, uh, and this is for the next uh, Acadian Co World Congress in 2019. So. So the plan would be to do an inventory of sites, uh, of heritage sites, uh, historical heritage sites in the area. The Three Rivers, uh, Shippity, uh, Pericodiac, and Memram Cook. We would do an inventory of historical sites and other things like uh, the, uh, uh, the dikes, uh, family monuments, uh, uh, important sites, uh, for instance, where there was a battle in the Blanchard village or Hillsborough, things like that. Uh, so we would put those sites uh, on maps. We would have three maps uh, that I'll introduce in a minute. Each site would be numbered, digitized, uh, uh, put on the map and it will be uh, gathered in three different uh, journeys, uh, with something that could be done in about half a day during the Acadian uh, World Congress for people to visit. So the upper, the card up there is a summary of the territory that we want to cover. And the first, uh, 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 trip, if you will, if, would be Moncton, uh, nor, uh, northern side of Petticodiac towards Salisbury, uh, uh, supposedly all the way down to, to Beausoleil. And then we would cross the river to go down in Albert County, Hillsbury, which was Village des Blanchards, Hopewell Hill, uh, Chippody, Riverside Albert uh, and Harvey. And that's where the Acadian communities were at the time. So trail number two would be the up to Memram Cook. 
Number three would be the Beaubassin and uh, Fort Beausejour, the communities that existed uh, around the uh, Beaubassin, uh, Beausejour, <laughs> after the destruction of Beaubassin. The map, so the card, uh, the map there up there, this was uh, created before deportation. So what's interesting in here is that the, number, the name of the small villages are identified. Uh, so Pre de Richard, Pre de Bourg, uh, all of these small villages were, uh, there was a census in uh, 1755, so we were trying as much as possible to identify where those villages were situated and located. I had to take the census of 1755 and try to associate both so that people that come to the Congress can afterwards uh, visit uh, those sites and say, well, it's about here that our ancestors came or were at before deportation. And, and we would take those three, three trails. We would uh, integrate this into a guidebook in three sections, each one for each trail. The guide would uh, contain also a description of the site, how to get there, uh, what road to take, what, uh, so that we have a nice view of the site. The geographical coordinates, uh, uh, people that are interested in geo geocaching, for instance, they travel with a, with a mobile, uh, with a GPS on it. And that's, uh, that's it for the guide. The families that we're targeting, those are the families that existed on the territory before deportation, but also new families like uh, the Gauvin, who settled the area. The objectives of the guide, so we want uh, the guide to be ready for the CMA in 2019, so people can are ready to visit uh, the historical sites in the area here, uh, linked with their families. Also, we've approached uh, the companies that offer guided tours and are interested in this to use this guide for their own tours. And the objectives also, we had um, to conserve history. When I did uh, a tour of Shibari with an historian, he made me realize that Moulin de Thibodeau, people will lose knowledge of where it was. We went to see uh, a, a rock which supposedly was part of the mill, Thibodeau Mill, we called the Acadian Museum at UDM. They went to get it. Now it's being exposed there, but there are many things that are gonna be lost uh, unless we document them, value them, conserve them. That's part of the objectives. Uh, we've met the Minister of Tourism to discuss uh, funding, but also the possibility of integrating uh, part of the information, at least uh, what we will gather and put it in their own uh, uh, tourism guide. And what we uh, propose is is to uh, set the, the, the basis to develop uh, historical tourism for the greater uh, Southeast region. The, the FAFA would be responsible for this to complete the project. And we want to do this for the CMA, the funding. Well, we are preparing a request to Canadian Heritage. We've already met the uh, Minister of Tourism in Brunswick and we want to solicit uh, 
uh, contribution also for, uh, from municipalities in the territory, mainly Moncton and uh, Dieppe. The, uh, the historical tourism potential for the CMA, we estimate about the same as the last time, about 60,000 participants. We also want to uh, make this a virtual experience. We have a website and a mobile app, and this would allow us to, to allow the people, to people that travel by car, to take their phone, to go to the site uh, through Google Map. Uh, it would be integrated uh, in Google Map. So I went to find some examples of what it might look like. The, the Acadian Federation in Nova Scotia has already done. They've already built a, a website and a mobile app for about the same type of... Uh, so this is the is site of the uh, Federation Cadine de la Nouvelle Ecosse. These are examples of sites uh, to be visited along the trails. In this view here, we can see that there's a button to read uh, more about it, uh, more details on the site to be visited. And they've also an integrated this in Google Map. Uh, on the left, we have a list of the sites, and on the right, the map with the points with in alphabetically uh, designated to identify those sites. So uh, Balado, in order to create their mobile app, uh, they've, they've chosen Balado. There are other software, but I thought I would give this one as an example. Uh, Balado has done a lot of uh, has developed a lot of sites uh, for several regions in Quebec. And this one here is the one for the fund. There are 12 interest, uh, points of interest. Uh, the interface uh, it looks about like uh, this with a map and the site to be visited. Uh, this is an example here. On the left, uh, we can do a search by uh, province, city. On the right, these are examples of uh, uh, sites that uh, exist, like for instance, uh, fortification in Quebec. We can put images uh, to describe the site, or we can also integrate some videos, for instance, to do the interpretation of a site. Uh, here is the, the site, these are historical heritage sites. Uh, this is uh, a database for heritage, Canadian heritage sites, and we can record uh, uh, sites on it. Uh, so our idea is that once we have completed the project, we would like to see if we could add other sites of the territory on on this uh, record. What's interesting uh, in this particular site is the Steve's house in Hillsborough. We do the interpretation. They have an eight page document. People can stop there. They will tell them the history of the Hillsborough battle. They also told us that the site of the church where the soldiers were burned uh, when the battle started, the site of the church is still there. They know where it is. Uh, so these are examples of things uh, to be seen in the area that are very interesting uh, for people that will come to visit uh, during the CMA. So. I hope you will support our project. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions on the part of the 
members of the council, Mr. Brido. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Masawa, a very nice presentation. I think it's definitely, we're, we're talking about the next Acadian uh, uh, gathering. I think it's a need anyway in our own community and region to have an interpretation, to have something uh, for which uh, visitors can not only see our people, our Acadians still living in the area. What I would like to know, you talked about the map with all those historical sites. You've also talked about uh, the small villages, names of small villages that existed in the past. Uh, and it's first time that I take note of this. In all of this, what's important as well is not necessarily only to establish it, put it on the map, to have people that are always uh, available to answer questions, to help people. Uh, of course, uh, you know, during the Canadian gather gathering, it'll be important to have people who can explain the history, our history. Uh, so, and this is something that could remain afterwards. Uh, you know, it's not just like a museum. A museum, you have to go there to uh, wait till it's open. And uh, but this year would be would be available year round for people that want to get information, that want to visit, taste it, if you will. Uh, what uh, we had in the long term uh, in mind would be uh, the interpretation. Uh, history interpretation center uh, in the area, maybe uh, Lefebvre, uh, sometime in County of Albert, uh, Fort Beau Sejour, uh, where we could stop. Somebody could tell us the history of the region. I had, uh, I'm thinking of questions that I was asked uh, recently a couple of people from France uh, asked me if I could send them information, uh, tourism information of what's happening in New Brunswick, kind of the sites that should or could be visited. And I'm trying to get uh, uh, bits and pieces there. Yes, obviously, we'll always talk about the Acadian village, the Pays de la Saguin, um, Hopewell Rocks. But I'd like to be able to pick up something of a guide to send them and say, here, uh, this is our province, this is what uh, to offer. Well, what's interesting with the, uh, the website and the mobile app, we will be able to modify it uh, later on if, if the city of Dieppe has other sites that they would like to identify and add. Um, to the mobile app or the website, it'll be possible to do so once it's, it's, it becomes digital and virtual. We'll put the, be able to put the screen here, a touch screen here in the foyer, and to go and discover those sites to be visited in the area. Or it could be at the Maison Doiron, anywhere in the public areas in Quebec. Uh, once it's done, we can improve it and work on it. As I said before, I think it's important to value those sites so that they're preserved, conserved, uh, protected uh, before we lose them. Thank you. Other questions from the council? Thank you. Uh, I agree. Yes, we have to value our and, and uh, our ascendancy, descendants, uh, our past. Uh, 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 but uh, it seems to me that fifty-five thousand grand is not much to get started. Is that all? Well, an estimate is an estimate. Uh, so I wish you uh, good luck uh, with this. It's definitely something that we will want to integrate. Uh, uh, so keep us uh, informed in your in your uh, re request to Heritage Canada. So if there's something that we can do, uh, especially with the Acadian uh, Congress of 2019, we would definitely be interested in collaborating uh, 
uh, financially. And I, be, I speak as mayor. You know, we're not in the budget stage yet, but I think that's something when we look at the amount, uh, depending on the level of success you'll have with Heritage Canada, they'll sometimes ask you if you have community partners uh, when you do a request. Uh, so please uh, contact our uh, uh, GM, uh, uh, Mark, uh, and uh, your colleagues uh, uh, that are well known. So will be able to give, uh, to lend a hand. Uh, during a recent visit in Montreal, and I saw in old Montreal, there's a lot of those installations uh, on the, uh, uh, you know, with historical facts, uh, the area where my, the, the house that Maurice Deja, uh lived in. And, and uh, you go to your, uh, to your Android or Apple, and, uh, and uh, it uh, tells you to tell you the story. It's really uh, very interactive, and it's the type of thing that my colleague, uh, uh, Councillor Bidadou, talked about. Uh, and as, as you said, it's all well, these are all things that could be added, uh, removed, uh, adapted. So thank you very much for the presentation. Mr. Gaudet, I know you want to talk. Please come to the podium. I know, I know this was uh, ticklish for you. It's such a nice project. I want to thank Mr. Paul Savoy the whole committee that worked really hard on this. Uh, the whole part of uh, uh, capturing, integrating uh, in on the phone. To me, it, this is a novelty for the region. I believe that the app can take uh, can greatly profit uh, from this because the bend, uh, the immediate uh, region, you know, on this side, uh, the bend uh, is very important in history, and also as part of the the circuit for the next Acadian Congress. Uh, I know the city has a lot of, uh, how should I say, uh, big ambitions. Uh, uh, for 2019, and I believe uh, that we would be really honored to take part in it with uh, heritage houses that we have, with things that could be added. I would uh, like to mention as well, as a president of the uh, Federation of Acadian Family, we have other uh, projects that we want to foster uh, family gatherings uh, will also be very important as part of this. And the participation with Beaubassin. Uh, Beaubassin is a bit in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick as well. And this whole circuit uh, in Beaubassin is being to reset up, uh, modified by uh, Heritage Canada, there'll be monuments of the Odyssey, different families where they were. Uh, I've f spoken with the, the head of Fort Folly, and Mrs. Knockwood is very interested uh, because this whole circuit, uh, Paul didn't go, into, didn't go into detail, but this whole circuit also goes through Fort Folly. So the whole ben uh, region would benefit uh, and on the end in Shippody, with the Thibodeaux and other families, when we try to talk uh, not only about the history, but the culture, the language, the French language, uh, uh, that we would like to uh, see uh, take uh, more strength in the area. This is a, a tool. and. Uh, inevitable uh, occasion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Gaudet. Uh, uh, Councillor Thibodeau, a last uh, intervention. I just wanted to add as well that when we talk about Chippewa, uh, we will install a monument there as well. Not exactly at Chippewa, but we, it, we get so uh, good the reception uh, the Riverside Albert uh, Village offers us the uh, location to set up the monument. So, yes, thank you very much. 
So the next item. So next is the participatory uh, budgetary process. Uh, we're only 17 minutes behind. 17 minutes, uh, we can live with that. Good evening, Your Worship, uh, councillors, colleagues. I'm here to speak to you of the second cycle of the participatory budget process. For those of you who are here, you know that we did a first cycle with a vote in 2015, and now it's a second cycle. So those of you who don't know what it is, uh, as we're often referred to as a PBP, it's the participatory budget process. What is this thing? Well, it's basically a project uh, where residents can determine what to do with a certain percentage of the operating budgets of the town. The council puts this forward and, th and, the, and residents through three phases. There's a dis dis decision making f uh, phase, uh, uh, an ideas phase rather, and then there's a, the uh, residents gather and they collaborate to develop these projects. And then they're proposed to the community and then they're voted on. That's basically that. It's what PBP uh, stands for. I'd like to uh, refer to uh, phase one. We had a historically high uh, young per uh, participation from young people. About a third of people participating were 25 years old and younger. We even under uh, allowed uh, those t uh, 12 years young and younger to participate. There was increased uh, citizen mobilization. We saw new faces, new ambassadors who became involved, and some of them continue to uh, be involved with the municipality under different facets. And we had um, international outreach of the municipality. Uh, we were sp all around the world, people were speaking of Dieppe. Uh, it even uh, started a little dispute with, uh, in South Carolina, they were talking about uh, they were they were they were complaining about uh, the the twelve the twelve they, that the fact that they weren't expect, accepting twelve and under as we were in Dieppe, and we had a choice of four new infrastructures uh, uh, to uh, see the light of day in Dieppe. So one of the four is the outdoor fitness park. The op uh, official opening will be uh, tenth uh, Sunday June tenth. It's near the aquatic center, so they invite the community to come participate. One of the second projects was an uh, a ball hockey uh, surface, and there was also the uh, Ecolimiro Nature Park, and finally the inner in interior climbing wall. It's currently uh, under construction. I spoke to the general manager uh, uh, just the last week, actually. I should say what's interesting with this project is that we saw other projects in the community, uh, projects that hadn't been retained but that were completed by the project uh, community due to the visibility they were able to get uh, funding and or generate generate additional interest i'm referring to the the chair for uh, wheelchairs at saint therese there was a beach volleyball field uh, it was opened up in just recently in dieppe uh, i'm not saying these projects wouldn't have happened otherwise but they said that the visibility they got from the participatory project it helped to get for them to get support so uh, the second cycle is struct. Uh, we changed the structure a little bit. Um, here are the different groups, uh, the different uh, stakeholders. So we have a PBP team. Uh, it's the former uh, direct uh, directing committee, steering committee. They're the uh, the the, uh, the uh, committee that uh, establishes the major guidelines for the uh, pro for the process. So they really drive it. There's a PBP manager. They may have the liaison between uh, active liaison between the uh, com uh, the municipality and the PBP team. There's a technical team in five different sectors working in terms of all of the technical aspects of this process to make sure that what the residents propose makes sense and that it, uh, it flows properly. Later on in the phase two, there'll be four groups of volunteers. These are people who that will ask to join committees. It would part of phase two. We'll present the details a little later. A new aspect of it is that we want to have a citizen jury, a new group of, of volunteers, but in fact, they will decide which projects will be on the ballot.
this will be a new group that we're creating this year. That's also part of phase two. So here are the members. Some of the members are here. Some could not be here. And some are very, very busy in their everyday lives. And some of them had other meetings tonight. But we still have a good representation from the group out of the 10, 10 members. And I'd like to pass the floor to Catherine Blondin, one of our members, who will present a few more slides concerning the, the further details about phase two. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm presenting a, a, few, a little more about the structure of the phase two. It comes from the assessment uh, that was done during the last cycle and then uh, the directors uh, from the steering committee from last autumn, last fall. So eligibility cr criteria, there's no real changes there compared to the first cycle. Participants who are eligible uh, to vote, they must live in Dieppe. They must be aged 12 years and up. They can only vote a single time. And then in terms of the eligibility criteria for ideas and projects, it must be um, a program, a service, or an infrastructure that is of benefit to the wider public. It must fit within one of the four categories that we, we will present just in a bit. Um, we've developed those categories based on the city's strategic plan. It must cor uh, correspond to a single expense item. Uh, so people can't, uh, uh, they can't g g call on another program where they get money from the uh, municipality. The expenses, it, uh, it, 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 there's a maximum of 45,000. Uh, they could ask for a single expense, but they could find other monies from other um, uh, funding sources. There's a, uh, there's a threshold of uh, a, a ma maximum amount of $45,000 per category project, the ideas that can be implemented by the town or a nonprofit organ nonprofit organization accredited by the municipality. So let's consider the timetable. So the ideas phase, it starts in June 2017 and ends in October 2017. Uh, then the projects uh, phase, which is the saying there's a citizen's jury. The, the a period during which the citizens would meet to in, make sure that the uh, projects uh, are cor correspond to the ad, admits, uh, eligibility criteria. That's from November to March, and the voting would ha happen from over three weeks. So the project categories, four categories, uh, uh, com connected community, creative community, and green community. We did this to have a wider range of projects, more diversity. A lot of the first cycle were based on sports, but we nonetheless wanted a, a really great level of uh, representative, representativity for all citizens. Everybody can find themselves in there. Young people, uh, senior citizens, new arrivals for different uh, uh, groups, there can be different projects and they can all contribute. I was trying to be rather clear in terms of the category, but we're still working on the descriptions. I'll try to be as clear as I can. So in terms of an active community, community well-being, going outside, you know, moving, uh, tra active transportation. So for example, if you go back to the phase one, so if I give some example of uh, what projects were on the uh, ballot, uh, there were um, special apparatus for for, uh, for wheelchairs, uh, uh, um, cross country skiing, uh, the the beach uh, beach volleyball of, uh, uh, area. They could all fall under active living. In terms of connected community, connected in the technology sense, but also in terms of connections between citizens. 
so either in person or virtually, so reinforcing, creating links between the uh, members of the community. We also want to create inclusive, inclusive uh, mechanisms that uh, gather the generations, intergenerational. Uh, for example, there was a, a, a one bike, one town uh, to have uh, uh, to connect uh, uh, to that younger young uh, people who are dropping out of school would uh, would ride would ride uh, uh, the bike for older people. Uh, that the library would be would have workshops that related to technology. Those are all projects that might fall under that category. In terms of the creative community, we're talking about arts, culture, and heritage, um, language, and stories. So, example of some stories. There was a heritage project. In terms of telling um, Dieppe's history with. Uh, uh, panels and, and, and videos that would uh, tell the story of the history of uh, the town and its city and its, and its inhabitants. Uh, there would be a, um, a light show and sound show at the pl place uh, plus 1604 and poetry along the, um, the Riverside Trail. There's some example of those pro types of project. In terms of the green, uh, green community, that category wants people to uh, push forward uh, sustainable uh, uh, developments uh, change people's behaviors. Uh, barrel uh, composters, um, electric car charging stations. Uh, I will look. Is uh, I want to. I'll pass the mic on to look. I can speak for myself, but I'd like to thank you for, for the opportunity to commit. To have this level of commitment with my community, I've been working with Luc on this participatory process, budget process, and I'm finding as a citizen, I find it's great. Thank you, uh, Madame Blondin. We're thanking you, uh, uh, all the groups of all of you uh, volunteers for involved, being involved in this participatory budget process. It helps us to help you build the future of this municipality. And personally. Uh, I think that what we're doing is creating um, uh, is some some people to replace us. In fact, the people sitting around this table, uh, we really appreciate the fact that you're becoming involved in your community, our community, and that creates a sense of belonging. And that's why the city of Dieppe is where it is right now. Uh, I also like to thank the members who are here, who are participating in the group, uh, Patril. Uh, Isabelle Melançon, uh, present last year, Judith Brooke, Marie-Claude, Paulin, he's a little hidden. Another person who helped us last year uh, with the budget process was Denis Legere. Denis Cormier, sorry. He's also here tonight. So, just to close close up, uh, when we speak of uh, volunteer groups, we, we're, we're going to get people to come become involved in phase two as of uh, October in those four different committees. So they'll take the ideas that were submitted and it's, uh, they'll have the, the duty to figure out uh, the, uh, the projects and go work through those ideas. And we're gonna start to put in some ads. Um, uh, that's how we're pro proceeding. Uh, so there'll be four volunteer groups that will meet weekly or on a monthly basis perhaps. Uh, they'll determine uh, to, to work on the, the project ideas we have. In about a, a year from now, more or less, when we go come to the balloting phase, in our four categories, we're going to have a choice of an identical number of uh, projects. Uh, there'll be three or four projects in each of the categories. Uh, so tw that means 12 to 16 projects. Last time we had 18 on the ballot. We'd, ho we'd keep that. The, it's a, what's particular about it is uh, the people who voted had to vote it five times. They couldn't just vote for the one project they wanted. So there's um, weighting, weighting that happens with that, mathematical calculations. It, uh, they have to vote for one time for each category in, uh, in, in each category. And, the, and each vote is weighted. The number one choice that they make in a category, if it's their first choice, it, it's worth more than their second choice. That, that and, and so on and so forth. So their first choice uh, weighs more than the fourth choice, and so on and so forth. Again, peop we can, the people will either be able to vote in person or online. 
other considerations on the part of the committee. You uh, you granted a two hundred ten thousand dollar budget for the entire project budget. One hundred eighty thousand will be directly related to the project with a limit of forty five thousand dollars per project. That's a that's the uh, threshold. That's a uh, that's the the cap. Uh, uh, so four four times forty five thousand. That's one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Doesn't mean that all projects will will only be for forty five thousand so, dollars. Uh, some some of them might be five, ten thousand uh, dollars. There might be some money remaining after you've chosen those four projects. In that case, then we go to the fifth and the sixth pro most popular project, as we did the last time. But it's important to note that the project has to have received a minimum of twenty-five percent of support in this category. But we don't finance a project that only received five percent of the support of the population. Those are the parameters, the criteria. So if you see uh, a, an example of a ballot, that's uh, that sort of you vote one for one category, one project per category, and so on and so forth. I think I mentioned that in terms of classifying cl classifying the ideas. Uh, that's it. Uh, so the ideas phase is in June. Uh, around the 12th of June, we'll launch the ideas phase, and during the summer, this, there'll be a student who will travel to increase visibility and collect those ideas. We encourage citizens to become involved and speak to us, pbp at dieppe.ca, and our, sit, our website will be updated very soon. Any questions on the part of the council? Questions from Mr. Godet. Thank you, Mr. The Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. My question's regarding the budget. The last time it was $300,000. 375000 I think. That was uh, $75,000 was the maximum. And here we see it's been brought down. Did the council discuss that? It was in the budget. It was dis discussed. That was 2017? Because the expense is only for next year. Mr. The Mayor, to have uh, financial stability uh, for this uh, uh, initiative, we put in uh, an, an annual amount to reach this objective over three years. We based ourselves on the recommendation of the, of the committee in the final re report that was submitted, and that's it corresponds to how we budgeted for it. Thank you very much. That's it. Other questions? Thank uh, Councillor Alain. Look, uh, just in terms of the the way the vote works, uh, will we still do it in the arenas or? Will we explore widening voting places? I found it's great. Uh, I know my girls, uh, they couldn't stop talking about it. Um, I, I, I want to congratulate the group that's right here. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. <coughs> the in we intend to continue that first cycle, that first uh, phase one cycle it's to, the, to the community, by the community. Yeah, we have the city hall, but if we are hoping to have, we're seeking to have more places, voting places as part of the mandate for the PBP team. We're going to speak about the details in terms of the communications uh, uh, department, in terms of how we communicate that. And, uh, and uh, within the community, we're trying to identify places for action. Thank you very much. No other seeing no other questions. Oh, hold on. Nolan's uh, microphone just lit up. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I really love to thank the group. Uh, I I uh, I went to quite a few some meetings. Uh, uh, Councilor Arsenal, we uh, we sit on the committee. We uh, we give uh, our opinions during those meetings and our points. Uh, I know the meetings can be very interesting sometimes. There's differences of opinion, of course. It's good to know that our citizens are, exp are have a great interest in par public participation. It's fantastic. Continue your great work. I won't be at the next meeting. I will be in Ottawa uh, for a convention, but I'm sure that uh, Councillor Arsenal will be there, and I will hear from what uh, hear tell from what's going on at the meeting. Maybe we can FaceTime remotely. Uh, thank you so much for your work, and um, that's, yes, that's what I have to say. That's it. So thank you, everybody. And we're going to continue uh, with our... I'm convinced that this is a passionate uh, uh, thing that's coming up, uh, and people want, want to stay. 
but we won't be insulted if you if you leave. Uh, so you don't have to put, go through the following uh, uh, region. We've thought about the long-term financial plan. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. I thought that uh, people, all those people were here for my presentation, but I guess I made a mistake. You're lucky that there's a few still left. So today, a presentation of a long-term financial plan. I'll explain what that means, a few ideas, uh, 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 things to be done uh, that should be done. Uh, so the long-term financial plan for DEP is the path to follow in order to ensure financial long-term viability. And it means that in 15 years from now, the uh, town, the city will be able to still offer its services now and new services as well. So the value of a, such a long-term financial plan so it's a long-term impact of decisions made today. So decisions we make uh, today have a long-term impact. Uh, a balance between now and the future development, and we want to take into account the debt and the uh, fiscal burden of residents. Uh, so this is the result of a strategy aiming to achieve and maintain a viability, a financial viability, so <clears throat> take into account the citizens' concerns, of course. So what are the advantages of a long-term financial plan? So it makes the town uh, conscious of the long-term impact of decisions to avoid some improvised decisions because of lack of information to keep the objective of spending according to our means, you know, uh, <clears throat> somewhat uh, like your budget at home. <clears throat> if you don't have money for a pool, you have to gather that money. So, so establish a balance uh, between uh, growth and uh, services to allow to avoid uh, financial traps, if you will, uh, uh, non foreseen expenses and excess borrowing. Excess. Um, I want to mention that, uh, you know, the uh, any asset, for instance, a building, there's the initial cost of purchase and all the other uh, costs, uh, maintenance, uh, power, renovations, repairs, uh, and even replacing it at the end of its life cycle. Well, that's usually 10, 20 percent uh, of the life cycle. So sometimes we talk, we think about the initial cost, but 80 percent of the cost, uh, sadly, are forgotten in the budget. Uh, so that's what the long-term plan helped uh, to avoid. Other advantages is to demonstrate to the public that the council has a long-term vision and show that it works uh, responsibly and transparently to show the municipal council is conscious of the financial decisions have an influence on the future viability of the town. <clears throat> the fundamental values, well, so resili resili resilience rather, stability, Financial viability, we talk about resilience, be able to s survive, uh, you know, economic impacts, we, we may not know what happens in five years from now. So if you have a long-term plan, it allows you to go through those challenges. The, we will have a long-term vision of its finances. Finances take advantage of costs, uh, priorities, uh, so we will have a solid uh, and uh, 
will have uh, budgetary discipline. We make the link between the long-term financial plan and the annual budgetary process by following the policies that have been set forth. So what is it? Well, it, it's a preview, if you will, projection of future results based uh, on various variables of uh, hypothesis at this time now. So it's, it's realistic. It's, so, of course, it's like uh, weather. We do forecast and then we adjust accordingly. For this year, we talk about uh, 2.5% uh, increase in revenue. We got a surprise, uh, which was uh, positive. Uh, it can happen both ways. So it's not a budget. It's not a preview indicator, but it does feed into the annual budgetary process and maintain the discipline at that level. So it helps with viability to a framework to make decisions and to de determine some compromises. Uh, the, fin the financial plan would help with that decision making. So financial health. So if we have an objective, a good financial health, we have, th have the courage to do this and not to stray from it, even though there may be obstacles along the way. So to reach good financial health, an organization must spend according to its means, to establish reserves, to have a good understanding of budgets and variances, to be transparent and incorporate economic analysis in its decision making. So to go back one by one, So overall, the DEP is in pretty, go, pretty good budgetary health uh, right now. The, the weak point is the long-term financial plan, and, and we're solving it with what we're doing now. Two aspects uh, uh, that we have to focus on. We have to stabilize growth uh, and also managing the assets. There's a graph, that, uh, graph there, but it's not uh, shown. It, w it showed the increase of the fiscal, uh, like in 20, uh, 2014 and uh, 2420 million. And that was a 20% increase in 2015, about the same 120 million. Uh, and that that represented only 4.5 percent increase. So even if it's as big as other years, well, the budget of the city increases year after year, so the percentage diminishes for those revenues. So in past year, the big years that we have with 14, 10 percent, we didn't have to increase taxes. We created new projects. We had new infrastructure. We didn't need to get supplementary. Uh, revenues today, it's not the case anymore. We want to get new infrastructure. The increase of the fiscal revenue uh, on, only helps uh, to meet the cost of uh, living increase. So we need uh, adequate funding and uh, capital uh, uh, stable, also adequate funding. We need the policy on the asset management. Uh, right now at the city, we have a committee. Uh, uh, Stefan and two other members and myself were part of a, the, we're part of a group, the, the FCM. Uh, Acadian Federation of uh, Municipalities, uh, Saint Quentin, and others. Uh, uh, there's an anglophone side to this. Uh, the idea was to create policies, strategies to 
to asset management and we're into this process now. And the next step will be to hire a consultant to develop uh, such an asset plan. It was already in the budget for 2017 and FCM will also give us some money to do this. In 2012, the uh, accounting principles have changed. So that's why when accountants come, uh, the new re, re uh, rules. And so we had a uh, study done by our vendor said we have to do an inventory of all our assets. And by doing this, we realized that we had at the time a deficit of about $38 million. Uh, and with infrastructure, well, does that mean all infrastructures that were obsolete or at the end of their life cycle? And if we had to replace them, we would need to eject uh, 38 million in one fell swoop. Uh, so right now we have 612 million in assets and infrastructure, so it's about 6%. Uh, it's not a big amount overall. But if we're not careful now, the problem will get worse uh, uh, gradually. The uh, study dimension, it said that we should invest 9.5 million yearly just to maintain existing infrastructure. Over the next 100 years, we would have to plan for 9.5 million. So, you know, based on 20, 10, 2012, uh, so that study itself should be updated and that's what we want to do with the uh, asset management plan to get the real numbers uh, to avoid that infrastructure deficit. Some other assets were created uh, during that time. We're not exactly sure where we're at now. Also, why to have such a plan? Uh, provincial rules, national rules uh, have changed. Uh, we get money each year from the uh, uh, fuel tax. It has been said uh, we don't know which year we'll have to do an asset management plan to be able to get that money. Many spouties who want to do it might be deprived of uh, getting this uh, 1.67.7 million uh, per year. There are various uh, factors uh, at the origin for the infrastructure deficit for Dieppe. The first one is a challenge in terms of growth. Some years we have phenomenal growth. Uh, that brought a lot of nice things, but also represents challenges. So it's important, uh, like over the last few years, since 2000, the priority was put on adding new assets and services to meet the needs, uh, growing needs of population. So we haven't stopped to put money on the existing assets, but perhaps a bit less than what we should have done. So that particular deficit has increased and we've added some more. So there was an increase of assets uh, where we need some uh, operating funds uh, when we have new assets. Uh, Indirectly, there are monies that we need to uh, use those assets. The stabilization of this fiscal revenue will be done over years. Uh, maybe we don't as mu have as much surplus to put into this. Uh, before the study by R.V. Anderson in 2012, we had no idea what the inventory was. This allowed us to know what our inventory was, the uh, life cycle, uh, and so on. Another thing that's not easy, the formula uh, used for unconditional grants uh, uh, from the province does not favor DEP. Uh, it's a fairly complicated, uh, well, it's nothing new, but yes, I wanted to mention it. So the good news is that this is not insurmountable. We need long-term planning. 
uh, to establish reserves. Uh, we have uh, different different plans, strategic plans, different things that we've done: a municipal management plan, a sustainable development plan. So the uh, uh, plan for uh, parks, uh, uh, so all the thing with uh, water and sewage. So we have a good idea of uh, what direction to take for the future. So now we have to establish priorities in the long term as part of a long term framework. As I mentioned before, various steps for good uh, financial health is to set up some reserves. Since 2006, we have different uh, programs to replace uh, equipment, uh, emergency, replacing green equipment, uh, replacing uh, cultural services, uh, and that uh, increased uh, annually. We have to be, to continue to be disciplined and uh, grow it slightly as a percentage, uh, a percentage of. Uh, uh, right now, there's no policy in terms of the use of reserves. Yes, we put some money aside, but there's no policy that says when can we access it or not. Uh, so we'll talk about policies that would solve this. Uh, understanding the budgets uh, to do this, we have. Uh, uh, so we have to review the budget to uh, help with uh, drafting different budgets, uh, facilitate the understanding of those for the municipal council and the public. Right now we have two committees in place and uh, one to assess the different uh, services offered in the EP, and the other one is a committee to look at all the sp expenses. Are there excesses, are there places where we could do some efficiencies, uh, things, cutbacks. Uh, we've done it some last year, but we want to go further this year. Transparency and costs of services. The uh, city knows the services uh, it offers and uh, how it does it efficiently. You know, in terms of continuous, uh, uh, continuous impro improvement, uh, we should do a review regularly, somewhat like what we're doing now with, through these committees. And the last point, the economic analyses. I want to focus more on those. I think it's the one that's the most important. Uh, uh, it's fundamental the, that each new project uh, will be accompanied by a detailed uh, financial analysis with its capital or the operation funds. Uh, they have to be able to de demonstrate the life cycle cost, funding, purchase, uh, operation, renewal. So it has to show all the costs uh, of this project will be paid by adding a new source of revenue, by cost recovery or cutting services that already exist. So we don't have the big years of 10 to 14% increase. So now each new project will have to show analysis. How can we afford this? You know, so it's like the, if the box is empty, uh, is full, well, if we want to add something to it, we have to take something out. Uh, that's what on the screen there, uh, that's about the only image I have. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a mis uh, mistake. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the blame. Uh, I didn't have time to go through communications. Uh, she might be able to say what, what the problem is. I think that's the page that Stefan did. Uh, managing up. So overall, the diagnosis 
of the financial health. Uh, it shows that we're in pretty good financial health uh, uh, thanks to different initiatives taken over the year. But to maintain these, uh, people have to prioritize and take difficult, take difficult uh, decisions to have a solid long-term plan. We should take into uh, take into account the stabilization of the fiscal uh, the revenue. Uh, it seems to be 2.5 percent. Uh, some years, where there's a lot of uh, construction permits and might increase it, uh, but it seems to be fairly stable. The uh, debt ratio. Right now, there's no borrowing policy except for the the municipal one uh, based uh, the, at the provincial level, it shouldn't be no more than 20%. Uh, there's no problem doing this in the app. We have gone overboard. We've adjusted to reduce it again. But the challenge is not how to uh, maintain the 20%. It's more to have the capacity of paying the, the what has been borrowed. Our budget increases year to year. And the percentage is easy to respect to. So, you know, paying the debt, uh, you know, interest, capital, that also increases. In 20, we see the graph here. We see that in 2019, with this year's projects, the new school, the new complex, uh, the marsh, uh, We'll pay about nine million dollars each per year to reimburse the debt, uh, depending on what we want to do. We should reduce this by 2019 to implementing this long-term plan. How to do this? To have a policy that says for us in the app, the cap would be 17 percent. So a number that we came up with, and we shouldn't go beyond it. If we do. We should have a meeting and say, okay, we've gone beyond that. What do we need to do to bring it back down? Our objective is to bring the debt ratio at 10% uh, over the next six, seven years. Uh, it's not impossible to do, but after the big years, the big projects, we'll have to tighten the belt somewhat and say that the three, four next years, we would virtually not uh, borrow for big projects. Uh, Eight to ten million for operations annual. We have an envelope of ten million dollars for capital projects, and that's what I say when we have difficult decisions to be made. So within that envelope, what do we decide? Here we can see the uh, debt ratio in terms of percentage, uh, uh, 9 million. Uh, overall borrowing would be 60 million. So we would be done. Don't forget the growth of the city uh, happened between 20, uh, 2004, 2006. They had many big projects. Even if the debt goes down, the payments are there. It's like a mortgage. You pay, you pay uh, for 25 years. So in the fifth, 25th year, you'd pay as much as you did the initially. But uh, eventually, some of these will disappear. So we'll be able to inject more money in the capital projects. Policies uh, to prioritize capital projects and investments. Uh, so that has to be done constantly reviewed as part of that long-term financial plan. So whether you prolong or uh, uh, we want to make sure to we continue healthy management. Uh, so questions to be asked, uh, is it part of the mandate and is it part of the strategic plan? Does it meet the uh, capital needs that already exist? Uh, 
does it meet some of the recommendations of the master plan? If, if their answer is no to all those questions, then we shouldn't do it. In terms of uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, we have to be um, take into account the life cycle. This has to be supported by a, a viable financial model. There's no quick uh, solution to this. When we talk about long-term financial plan, it can be done. You don't do it overnight. We have to have budgetary discipline. So it will help to make sure that public funds are used uh, at the right time to offer quality services. And practically done. So good financial health in, in, includes the good financial possibility. Uh, these strategies are listed. The first policy, again, prioritizing uh, a capital investment projects. As I said, the three questions that we need to ask. Yeah. So focus on existing uh, uh, inventory and assets. Uh, we have to have an idea of what we, where we are financially, if we're on the right road to increase annually uh, to replace equipment. Uh, so not big uh, increases, but this would increase annually anyway. Create a program to replace buildings. Uh, right now, the fleet, uh, uh, PD, Asheville, we don't have a program to replace buildings, which is something that could be, should be a priority. We're lucky here, the uh, buildings are fairly young, we don't have to repair too much, but we have to plan already for the future. Right now, the money that we put in the, uh, uh, what we put into capital and paying the debt is about 27%. Uh, so 27% of our budget for capital projects. In uh, policy, we say we never want to go below 25%. So as the debt goes down, we'll have more money but we want we should uh, keep it for capital at about 25 percent any new infrastructure project should be accompanied by f a detailed financial analysis second policy this is on debt and uh, managing affordability the we would uh, favor the approach of pay as you go rather than go and borrow. Yes, otherwise we'll, we'll need some borrowing to fund projects, but to try to do it in the proper way. The maximum limit uh, for the debt ratio, as I say, would be under the, the line of 17%. The objective of the town would be to take it down to 10% by 2027, and it's not unrealistic, uh, maybe 1% a year. Uh, 2018 to 2021, 20, practically no borrowing. A maximum of three million over those three, four years, we, we could borrow three million. And from 2022, we would borrow about 1.5 million a year on the average. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to borrow for on the back of the next year. Third policy, it's more general uh, financial management. Uh, what the, the, uh, I, the city adopts a uh, long-term vision of its finances by taking into account the following uh, things. Uh, life cycle to state the costs and advantages for development. Uh, we, we'll always have a city that's growing uh, for the next few years. So we have to consider the growth of the city. And so uh, healthy uh, financial management, uh, taxes, revenues, and also priorities in terms of capital. So we would update each year the financial priorities 
and prepare an, an annual budget to, to manage this properly. So in conclusion, the council commits in the new era of uh, financial health and sustainability by approving a long-term financial plan uh, for 20 years and policies associated. It reaffirms to the public that the municipality is responsible and transparent and will continue to supply services, quality services, while ensuring a balance between possibilities of development and expanding to answer the needs of the uh, growth. Thank you, Mr. Landry. Questions? Councillor Alain, thank you very much. That was an elaborate exercise. Regarding three things, maybe you'll answer my question. There will taxation each year we have to for our residents what will be the impact <coughs> to not increasing the tax rate uh, uh, we could incorporate that um, we speak of infrastructure we speak of uh, matching what's, what's the what's the game plan for buildings uh, long term for development plan for paving, for example, if we stop for four years. These are all scenarios that I would like to see how they might have an impact on your analysis. I'm not presenting it here, but for the budget exercise that we did, we presented a large Excel file over several years. We do have that file. It's interactive. I don't think it, this is the forum to show it. it's too small it's hard to explain but um, but we should see it uh, uh, soon it, this is great what you've done good things I think there's as quite a bit of transparency here we can discuss it as a group uh, we're, we're, we it's good good it's, we are all agree in agreement there's a big project coming up uh, major investments we have to look at our choices but if we had like enlightened choices, uh, we could speak of different scenarios, then there's no surprises and we can make good decisions as groups. Uh, congratulations on this. It's, uh, I like what you've done, but if, but if we can have a little, uh, a few more scenarios, this is something I would like to see before voting, before supporting this document. I'd like to see more scenarios. One of the first steps is uh, the infrastructure deficit to update that study, to know where we're at. Is it, if the deficit is at uh, 20 million, if it's now at 70 million, we maybe missed the boat somewhere. So there's, there's lots of software that exists to offer scenarios of that nature. So the city of Dieppe, we put mil eight millions of dollars a year to handle infrastructure. What, are the, what, the, what does it bring to us? Uh, let's say we don't do anything on the roads for four years. Will it cause a major problem? Th that's those softwares, th then you can determine all those things. For example, uh, the next door town, they bought that software. Uh, we had a meeting at the, at the UDM, at University of Moncton, and they, at the start, they wanted uh, roads sixty percent satisfactory. It was not realistic. Instead of putting eight million, they would have had to invest seventeen million. These are just figures I'm pulling out of the air. For but uh, they had to re lower their level of satisfaction to forty percent. This uh, there is software like this. If we don't put, if you don't invest in buildings, for example. Okay, that's, that'll be okay for 10 years, but on the 11th year, you'll have to inject 3 million just to repair a building. So I don't have those, those da that data right now. Oh, actually, I don't have the software to handle that right now. But uh, uh, with the inf infrastructure deficit, with, that says we have to invest $9 million. If we don't invest that $9 million, something is impacted uh, at the end of the line. 
Thank you, Councillor Godet. Uh, my question is related to this notion of long-term tax taxation, especially around this notion, and we often speak about this around the table, and we hear it outside uh, the notion of legislating our taxation rate uh, to uh, cost of living, whether it's uh, commercial cost of living, the general population's uh, cost of living. There's certain advantages to that approach for the population. They will know long term what uh, their commitment to the city is. Do you have a sense of what are the inconveniences, the traps that we might fall into with that such a system? And uh, do you think that we should uh, study this? There must be examples around the world where this type of uh, uh, approaches take is undertaken where municipalities are only based on uh, cost of living in terms of their budget and if there's an additional amount it's based on a very specific project for the community yeah let's take the example of the excel uh, sheet uh, that i will show you at the right time there's an increase uh, in cost of living two to 2.5 percent it's a realistic figure but it, but there's different. They can make it vary. Salaries, uh, uh, RCMP services. Sometimes RCMP service they go they gone up ten percent, and then uh, so then uh, so then we so far we've got two point five percent. Is it realistic? It might not be high enough, but the increase of cost of living with two percent for electricity, for example, it might be lower. It ends up balancing out. Uh, in the sheet, uh, I'm putting uh, an increase of an annual increase of one cent for the next few years. One cent annually. It's not even one percent. Uh, doesn't even represent. It does not even represent an increase of one percent for uh, for residential dwelling. I think it's on the last page. Um, the hundred eight thousand, hundred eighty-three thousand dollar house. That's the value of the houses sold in 2016. But the average price of a house in Dieppe is two hundred twenty thousand dollars. All the houses together increases the figures a little bit. So uh, that figure of one hundred eighty-three thousand for a residence uh, at the tax rate we have right now. That means they would pay two thousand nine hundred and sixty-four dollars annually. Let's say we increase that by 1%. That would represent 1.6 cents. A uh, 1% increase is 1.6 cents increase. So one, that 1 cent we're talking about, it's, it's, it's lower than a 1% increase. Uh, but it would represent about 30% more on the tax property bill for $182,000 home. Everything increases, electricity costs increase, telephone, and so the town when increases, it's the tax base, but now it's stabilizing. So that increase will not, uh, 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 it means that we can't keep from increasing taxes if we want to keep the same services. To answer the other question, if there are studies that have been done, well, lots of statisticians, uh, financial statisticians, they're saying that it's better to increase constantly than to not do it for three years, and then to, to increase uh, four cents in a, in, a, in a shot, in one in one fell swoop, uh, it's uh, people are less surpri are surprised. They're not it's, it's they're not happy about it. If the citizens know that it will increase uh, annually, they're not happy the first year, but they will expect it for the years following. So I don't think it's an exaggerated approach. The scenario that w says that we increase by a cent. That's what the that's what the borrowing. We're not borrowing for the next uh, four years, but if a project uh, presents itself and we have to borrow, then then uh, you either need to increase taxes or cut services to cover that. I also think that considering that possibility, we'll have to consider the possibility of of, of assessments, commercial assent commercial and residential assessments. Uh, together with the cost of living increase, if the municipality wants to, uh, can handle an increase of 1.5 percent, 
and the tax base increase contributes 1.2 percent from that of that 1.5 percent. So the, then that reduces the tax increase to 0.3 percent. But but it has to be done together, not separately. Uh, for the moment, it's separate. Our, our, the way we uh, apply taxes, it's uh, independent from the assessments done at the, at the provincial level because we have to prepare ourselves in advance. Normally, it's an estimate based on an estimate provided to us by the province at the end of November, something along those lines, I think, 30th November. Quite useless for this year. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. So, Mr. Godet, is that everything? Somebody else? All right, my turn. I have, it's very practical, my, um, what I'm going to raise here. We're speaking of the Harvey Anderson uh, to, uh, study from 2012. It's the first study, but of course, because of the, uh, the changes of the fiscal uh, tax, taxation reports, uh, the PISA versus the, the, other, the previous system. Either I misunderstood or if I've understood, I'm th quite disappointed to know that we're going to have to do that study again uh, of the assets and uh, the asset study. Who was responsible for ho keeping track of those assets as we added assets and took assets away? And, sec and what insurances will the council have that once we have redone the study uh, as you're proposing, who will be responsible for this study? The inventory of assets, it's all still there. We've added all the other assets. When I say we're reading the study, it's, the, it's in terms of coming up with a management plan for the assets. The major pl plank right now for the municipal government is to create a policy, a, a strategy for managing assets that we don't have right now, and to establish rules, stable rules that say, this is what the money will be uh, 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 devoted to. Um, the plan is to incorporate all of that. And that, and the software I'm talking about, it's, it's, a, it's an integral part of that management plan for assets. Uh, and currently, I'm handling it. I'm currently, I'm handling the inventory list. I have an, an inventory list of 11,000 line Excel sheet, probably 100 columns or columns or so. It, uh, it doesn't, it, it no longer meets the needs for the information that we want to provide. Mr. Alain was talking about different scenarios. Uh, uh, if we had that software, we could consider those scenarios, but the Excel sheet, it's, uh, it's conditional statements, it's what if statements, uh, it's pretty exhaustive, it's pretty, it's pretty much done what it can do. The, the previous study is not gone, it's, uh, the inventory is still there. It's, it's updated. Thank you. I am happy to hear that. I will sleep better tonight. The other question, uh, it's more of a commentary just to support what you were saying just now. Uh, I think that's what it's important is the amount of dollars in terms of debt payments. It's for, more significant for me than the ratio, the debt ratio. The debt ratio we, uh, I remember as a citizen, I remember when we, how we handled, my perception of it anyway, how we handled it in the past, uh, this problem of debt ratio and how we managed to do it. We increased expense, expenses, you know? We just increased expenses so that within the formula and ipso facto, the, the debt ratio went down. I will leave that on the table. For me, debt ratio is not the best measure of the efficient, how effectively a municipality is managing its uh, assets. Uh, I've often have this uh, debate with people from municipal affairs, people from the province. There, I, 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 I feel better. I've told, I've, I've really told you what I feel. Uh, do does my comments call up more questions? If not. Uh, I will thank you for your excellent presentation and a very interesting presentation. Hey, everybody's got uh, their own, uh, are passionate about different things. So for the members of the council, thank you very much. Next, I next item, I think it's the...
Richard, sorry me, uh, Mr. Simon for the um, procurement. It's uh, happened in the past, or over the last past few months. Uh, there was some questions regarding procurement and um, uh, bidding. So uh, our administrators uh, thought it was a good idea to in for refresh our memories, uh, inform us, and maybe perhaps instruct the uh, members of the council. So thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, Councillors, uh, a few months ago, I was receiving lots of requests at, in town, uh, in the city, regarding uh, um, call for tenders. My colleague was working on call for tenders, and uh, uh, the question is, is it legal, uh, uh, what we're about to do, or what we did? I have those two questions. Come to me. So uh, at that, I decided to, to come up with some documentation uh, some information. So, a few weeks ago, there's a guide was published in the prov by the province. It it sort of pushed back this presentation a bit. What I want to do with you right now tonight uh, is to uh, highlight the main principles that govern uh, call to call for tenders, and then I'll be able to present this to my colleagues my directors. My colleague uh, spoke of rationalizing and watching uh, watching your expenses. Now I'm going to speak about ex spending them. Uh, the city of, of, of Dieppe spends lots of, sp several million. It seems like a rather ordinary thing, but it's very important. It's an activity. Uh, it's, it's, there's risks associated with this. Uh, contractors, suppliers, uh, they uh, they don't. They don't uh, hesitate to go to court against uh, uh, c cities that uh, twist uh, the call for tenders procedures, and it's important. Uh, uh, within the city of Dieppe uh, procurement, there's a framework. It's a bylaw. It's A6, covering um, approval of uh, budgetary expenses. Uh, we speak of budgets in that bylaw. But in the appendix, we also speak of uh, the, the rules governing procurement in the city. So the ma four major principles are in this bylaw. The council must annually approve budgets by a majority vote. Uh, any expense over uh, estimated to be over $50,000 must, uh, $50, must be approved by the council. Uh, any expense that is not registered with the budget must be approved by the council. And all purchases of goods and services, as well as all um, uh, maintenance and construction markets, must be done in accordance with the rule, uh, New Brunswick Rule 2493, established based on the uh, law on um, public tenders. As look at the law, look at the rule, follow the rules. There's no particular rule. So here in the city, the question of goods and services are mostly done. Um, uh, we go see a, a supplier. We, we deal with the supplier directly. We're necessarily going to for a call to tender. There's also restricted or public uh, call for tenders. And we're going, we look for costs. We look for expenses, uh, prices. Um, there's a, a request for proposals. It really it does involve call for tenders. Um, that's, that process will involve many other characters, uh, criteria other than price. It's there is a committee evaluation and you a score is grant is 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 uh, allocated. Uh, for example, uh, auctions. But uh, well, I will uh, I'll I'll go I'll skip past auctions for now. Uh, there's three major uh, um, uh, categories of goods and services. Uh, goods, you'll see why uh, we make a distinction between them. Uh, goods, uh, um, uh, fixed, 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 go fixed goods, uh, first mat primary materials, materials, uh, physical objects of all types, uh, liquids, gas, gases, electronic material. 
uh, that's those are goods unless they're purchased as part of an overall construction process pro, uh, pro contract. So that's uh, that does part for fall under uh, building contract. So services, all services, including printed services, removal of garbage, uh, snow removal of snow, uh, uh, salt uh, salt spreading, uh, cleaning and maintenance services, uh, study services, public services. Um, uh, uh, consultancy services, professional services, unless they're purchased as part of an overall construction uh, contract. So let's say we build a building and there are uh, architectural services, engineering services included as that, that falls under the construction contract. And finally, construction services, there we're talking about building, demolition, repairs, renovation of a building, of a structure or any other work. Um, uh, uh, roadway, uh, 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 bridge, etc. So, a question we get asked a lot: uh, as there's a mix of services and goods, how do we know to how do we do go about distinguishing them? Unless it's construction, if the value of the service is higher than the value of the goods, which is seen as a service, and inversely, and vice versa. So why is it important to make that distinction? Because there are obligations related to each of those types of acquisitions. In regarding uh, goods, uh, goods uh, of a value uh, of over 25,000, it doesn't take into account taxes, the value of the purchase itself, uh, excluding taxes. If it has, uh, if the value of the, of the good is above $50,000, it's an obligation. They must do a call, public call for tenders. Um, same thing for uh, uh, services above $50,000. Uh, regarding construction, it's $100,000. If we build a building or, or infrastructure that will cost more than $100,000, there's an obligation to go to call for public call for tenders. Uh, earlier, it was twenty-five thousand dollars for uh, goods, around fifty thousand. Um, uh, the obligation to uh, announce uh, call, public call for tenders uh, on the uh, RPA and B, it's and B on uh, network, and there must be the, uh, an ad must be placed there. Uh, goods uh, for uh, equal or above twenty-five thousand, it's. Uh, it, that page is an internet page, in fact, for suppliers, towns, uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, they have access to it. They can uh, they can uh, announce their call for tenders, and the uh, suppliers can look for documents and s submit to various organizations. Regarding publicity in, in uh, newspapers, it's possible. Uh, it's not mandatory, but cities can opt to do that. There's a length that's uh, mandatory. Uh, it's under the law. Each of those uh, announcements, uh, um, it, so the announcement for uh, um, a notice, notice for uh, call for tenders must be uh, within 15 days. You have to at least uh, plan for that 15-day peri period. It's uh, mandatory. Um, for construction, I would say, oddly enough, there's no minimum uh, a timetable of 15 days. We talk about a reasonable delay, but we nonetheless recommend to go for the uh, the 15 day period. So that's a summary of the call for tenders process. Uh, it's a it's a nine step process. Uh, so we designate the the purchase. What do we have to determine whether it's a good service or or a construction. We have to estimate the value of the purchase. That will say whether we need to go uh, proceed to call to tenders, call for tenders. Then we'll write documents for call for tenders. This is notice. Uh, this is simply how we announce uh, that the city will be proceeding to call for tenders for such and such a project. And um, the quote is the is the document that will precise stipulate the works that we want to do or the goods and services that we would like to acquire. And then, uh, after that, then you uh, you have to pub publish the notice for call for tenders, fif 15 days. This is on the internet page, as uh, that I referred to earlier. Then you open op your, then you open the, the submissions. 
so for uh, request for proposals, uh, 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 confidence with, eval with evaluations, then we'll uh, st uh, study whether or not the submissions are in compliance. Uh, this is also uh, d done for ones not based on price. Uh, you be, st study compliance and uh, will uh, sorry, uh, submissions that are not signed or that don't meet the, re the request being made or that uh, illegible, this happens. Uh, once the once you open the envelope, uh, then we set that uh, offer aside. Uh, if there's an evaluation by a committee, there there will be a by a selection committee for um, those submissions that are in compliance. Um, I, uh, based on my experience, I would recommend that when the that the committee's selection committee, they should make their selection independently to prevent somebody could say. Uh, could um, could uh, sort of uh, take a lead of, uh, over others and decide where it's heading. It can come up. It can lead to an evaluation that's a bit more, uh, at least in more neutral evaluations. A uh, minimum of three members of the selection committee should be should form a selection committee. If we can have more, it's better. Um, I would recommend. I also recommend that we be able to deal with people from outside of the town for those committees of the city um, to have an external view. This is, I've, I've referred, I've made that recommendation internally, but that's, that's all I'll say about it tonight. But there's a lot of r rules that allow us, that uh, make, ensure that the process is valid and effective for the, for the town, for the city. And then I spoke about the evaluation and then at the end of the, of the assessment, We'll uh, 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 look at all the all the marks. We'll sort of make the average of the marks obtained, and the best mark uh, wins. Uh, you can also foresee uh, calculations based on the price. Uh, there's an infinite number of possibilities. Uh, you can be very creative regarding calls for tender, call for tenders, calls for tender, to ensure that you meet the, re the requirements. And then after that, you uh, grant uh, the call for tenders uh, to the one to the tender that had the best mark, and then you communicate the results. Uh, there are rules for the person submitting. And there's rules for the information that you give to the person sub to the group submitting. You don't send the sub the sub submit the submission to from one competitor to another. Uh, if you know the rules. Uh, regarding conf confidentiality and so on, and those are applicable, so the delicate situation, be very careful. We must be very careful then. So then we'll find uh, during um, um, in call for tenders, um, the lower, uh, the lower uh, 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 submission, uh, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily allow the town to um, uh, to eliminate all the the uh, the, uh, the uh, submissions and keep the submission that really uh, does what it do, does, needs to do for the town, you need to uh, the best uh, has the best uh, call for tender and that meets the requirements uh, enunciated. It's a jurisprudence principle. There's lots of jurisprudence in all this, and um, calls for tenders. It's a area. Uh, there are myriad uh, judgments to be made there. It's quite impressive. There is uh, lawyers, that's how they make their living, just working on calls for tenders. Uh, and one interesting thing for people to know is most uh, contracts um, established by the government can also be used uh, 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 by municipalities, like uh, piggyback clauses. You just need the contract number, and we can procure at the same source as the province at the, the same uh, terms and conditions. Usually, you simply have to check uh, uh, the contract documents uh, with the province, and these are all things that are possible. Y well, I spoke of the major principle. There are exceptions. Um, we're going to see there's lots of exceptions. Uh, try to go over them rather quickly, but for example, it's possible to give preferential treatment to a local supplier in certain situations. For example, the, uh, the public cough tenders, uh, it's for um, 
uh, goods of a value lower than twenty-five thousand uh, to fifty thousand uh, dollars below fifty thousand dollars in services. We're not within the minimum amount for the uh, prescribed in the law, stipulated under law. So we might, we could prefer a local uh, supplier, but it's conditional. It, it must be clearly indicated in the uh, call for tenders document. From my uh, memory, it's something we can do only once. Okay. okay. We have to follow the rules based on calls for tenders. Um, there's a risk uh, in not following this. Uh, I'm not speaking about the exceptions here. Uh, and Ms. Palliette f chooses not to follow these rules. Uh, uh, they can, uh, subject to legal, uh, legal, legal uh, um, consequences. Jurisprudence comes into this. It can also hurt the image. Uh, can be bad, made to bad press, and in the end, it'll cost more than whatever savings uh, uh, that you might get by not following the rules. Oftentimes, uh, the penalty for a city that doesn't follow the rules, uh, it, it'll be to pay the, co the competitor who wasn't, whose services or goods were not retained, the equivalent of that profit that would have, he would have earned if uh, he'd gotten the contract. So it's, it's a double penalty. You do your contract, and then you got to pay somebody who doesn't do anything. So we avoid these things. There are many exemptions that are foreseen. Uh, in the law that's not very well known. Uh, I, th I think you'll uh, hope you'll learn a few elements. The rule 2014-93 that allows you to exempt uh, municipalities from some rules and there are many, many of them of those. Uh, so obviously we can be exempted, but we have to justify it. Uh, it's fairly important. Uh, so I go, uh, uh, so uh, restricted uh, competition in some uh, aspects, we can restrain some of the, we still have to go to public tender, but uh, of, uh, so we can look at the roles and to be able to go to the greater public uh, or to, uh, to look at all of Canada, so the article 152 that uh, foresees this, I'll, I'll leave you the list uh, to look at uh, 153 as well. Uh, also uh, restricted the competition, and that's uh, more or less for municipalities. Uh, uh, for instance, also an organization that would manage a Congress Center or sports installation to be able to get some elements uh, uh, they're not subject uh, to the interprovincial agreements or international agreements, then we can be exempted. And that's why I don't insist, insist on this. It's there for information. We'll, we'll go to the next one. There's also an exemption. We talk about compatibility with existing goods. Uh, we've already done this in the city for equipment for potable water for drinking water, we have some equipment uh, we needed. Uh, we work on that call for tender for equipment that will also be compatible with those equipment. Uh, so uh, compliance with the law, in order to not be had, have to buy another uh, data processing system that would not be compatible, we have to. So rather than do this, we say, We'll focus on what's uh, compatible. We have already have a product. Uh, we look for that software or equipment that will adapt uh, to what we have. And it's allowed by law. We can also limit to 155 here, uh, um, good services uh, and sort of supplies at the Canadian level. So uh, aspiring suppliers uh, must be informed by uh, documents, uh, uh, requirement in terms of Canadian content uh, should not be superior to what is required uh, for the goods or the service uh, aimed by the public market. Uh, anyway, uh, 
in majority of cases, our suppliers are Canadian anyway. When we go to a tender for road structures, we talk about face-to-face uh, uh, -face agreement, uh, and then so we set aside those uh, rules for tender. Uh, you see uh, an example here at 156, if only one supplier is able to satisfy the requirements. So we talk about exclusive rights. Uh, uh, somebody would have a, 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 a patent or, you know, if there's only one patent on one we need, uh, we don't do a call for tender. We go directly to that person. Same thing if there's no competition, we'll make an agreement. Uh, so the list will contain the basic products, uh, not then apply really to us. Uh, 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 something you might find on the stock exchange. Uh, I think we need a lot of coffee, but I don't think we need to go that far. Other exemptions, uh, work that has to be done on a located, uh, on a rented uh, building that can only be done. There are, I haven't even found uh, concrete examples of this, but uh, uh, work that's uh, necessary uh, through a uh, warranty if we buy a building. Uh, so uh, we may uh, deal directly with the supplier. There are other exemptions for your information. We talk about a prototype, a good service, a new good service. In my case, we did uh, business with a German uh, firm they had uh, installed uh, a water filtering system, There's something completely new, so that's possible. We can do this. Uh, I was in the James Bay in those days. Uh, so uh, conditions that are exceptionally advantageous that allow us to uh, side uh, line the, uh, not for current purchase also original works of art, uh, uh, one that we've bought or want to buy for the uh, place uh, 16, uh, 1604, we don't do a call for tenders, we make uh, specific agreements. Uh, somebody who wins a design, so that will allow uh, us to make the plans, uh, the design of a building, for instance, we didn't go to tender. We same thing for uh, newspapers, magazines, and so on. That's less lever relevant. Uh, some other exemptions: uh, services of less f less than fifty thousand. If for reasons of a bit capacity, knowledge, or experience. Only one or a few people can meet the requirements of the market. You know, the manual people that are experts in, in renovations of uh, antique buildings, uh, it could happen that you will find few uh, carpenters or uh, uh, woodworkers that would be able to do this work. Also, in case of emergency, when you have unforeseen events, uh, you don't uh, wait for 15 days for tender. Uh, you, you go directly. When a uh, court offer would uh, reduce the capacity to maintain safety or public order, to protect the life, uh, health of humans, uh, animals, or uh, vegetation. Should that be a uh, closed meeting? Uh, do you see other uh, elements, person-person uh, uh, or, or uh, personal agreements uh, for goods dis destined to uh, resale to the public, uh, goods and services supplied by philanthropic, philanthropic uh, institutions, uh, financial uh, and analyst services or uh, managing investments, um, 
for uh, financial services related to managing the assets or uh, uh, operations uh, having to do the you know service health services and uh, you know uh, nothing prevents us uh, to go to tender even if it says much uh, degree agree if we you know if you want to make a direct agreement uh, uh, if we go to a tender often uh, the fact that we ask will have will ask for guarantees and you know this uh, and it's sometimes it has the effect of increasing prices of course there's warranty that's uh, that's an advantage uh, but it does increase price rather than dealing directly other exemptions uh, publicity pr less than 200 uh, grand uh, so in terms of uh, pr it can be up to that for goods and services supplied by department or organization managed in appendix b municipalities so we have agreement uh, with uh, Capelli, for instance, with Beaubassin, we may didn't need to go to tender. It was a direct agreement with them. For uh, transportation by local businesses in terms of construction work, uh, that's another exclusion. And that's something also that exempts us to go for t to tender. Also this uh, for building uh, materials, road repair when it's possible to show that transportation costs and technical considerations would limit uh, geographically the sources of procurement, you know, in terms of sand, uh, rock, gravel, uh, bitumen, you know, if it's done on one side of the river. If the bridge is 400 kilometers away, well, we'll probably take the local, the local guy goods and services relative to the cultural artistic uh, domain that's another element uh, where we allow to go directly so uh, it's a long list as i said before we talk about emergencies uh, in this case is if if the process didn't allow to get the goods in a in the proper time for consultants on uh, confidential nature. Uh, like I mentioned before, as an example, it's confidential in terms of safety. If we had a safe or a, a particular data processing uh, safety measure, we could go direct and deal directly, probably in, uh, in camera. In terms of sport and uh, buildings in order to uh, for goods or services acquired and uh, to respect uh, 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 commercial agreement that was done before it's I don't think it really applies to us but it's good to know that it's there again uh, direct um, uh, dealing uh, goods and services or of a nonprofit uh, other than the philanthropic establishments, as we mentioned, you know, our goods uh, made or s services supplied by um, uh, incarcerated people or handicapped people for services in terms of representation or promotion in the province or outside, uh, for example, and we might want to lobby some organization in some other country. So we're not going to go for tender to find rep. Uh, will go we'll deal directly with the firm to do this. In terms of regional economic development, this is an exemption that's particular. We can get an exemption from the minister. Uh, and the minister can, after consulting the uh, board of directors, uh, uh, give uh, a dispensation to the municipality if the uh, following conditions are respected. Municipality shows that the region of the province could get uh, ec uh, important uh, economic impact and the, mar the market respects. Uh, so do you want to take uh, questions uh, uh, or wait till the end? Uh, 
I'm two slides from being done if, uh, if it works for you. Exemption for uh, professional services, you see a list there. They're exempted from the obligation to go to tender to get their services. And uh, it's pretty well the same list. Uh, architectures, uh, lawyers, uh, doctors, dentists, uh, they're all part of that uh, professional services. So in conclusion, so procurement is an indispensable, complex, and delicate process. I can tell you from experience that a member of the staff uh, show a really good will to follow this, uh, these rules. I'm consulted regularly. Uh, there's always space for improvement, uh, and this presentation is part of that improvement process. Uh, and, and we will do this to our colleagues uh, here in, this, in town. Will uh, work to improve the process. So, a question from uh, Councillor Godet. My question is about uh, professional services. I'm curious to know a lot of services in there that we may not use as often as others. Some we often use often, like engineers. Uh, is there a municipal policy in terms of the use of uh, for public works? Uh, we build roads, uh, we choose engineers, uh, and it's considerable amounts. I think at the last one, 180 grand, uh, and I think it was a Roi firm. Uh, so how would we choose them? Is there somebody that does arbitration to ensure fair play or... Uh, is, uh, is it uh, a bureaucrat uh, 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 who makes decision? And same thing for architects. Who chooses an architect, uh, uh, you know, for the appointment we need? Uh, what I've seen often, everything has, uh, must be integrated. Uh, we'll have a firm that proposes the building, and they will call upon an architect uh, uh, with like with whom they like to work normally, and by choosing uh, this business, we choose the professionals. Uh, like the last time, the engineer was attached to the company that got the contract. I'd have to check. Uh, is that what happens normally? If I may, we try to spread out. Uh, in terms of engineers, uh, we try to spread out uh, between the firms in the area. Some have some specialties. Uh, you know, for the marsh, we had a consultant who had expertise in, in the wetlands and sensitive zones. Uh, we've also called upon uh, interest of uh, uh, expression of interest. So we have a diversity of methods uh, to try to keep the, the costs uh, at a low uh, level, it, there's a variety. It shows uh, still that there are exceptions here anyway. Uh, we still want to com have competitivity and to use the diverse regions in the area. Is there, is there a management committee? It but be the engineer services in collaboration, they, they see the expertise that's required and they make the decision them themselves. Other questions? If not, so we thank you very much for clarification. Uh, uh, it's refreshing and interesting to hear that our directors follow uh, to the letter uh, by the book, and you make sure of it. Revision, uh, Mr. Richard, for uh, so for the revision of the advisory committee structures. Uh, 
Good evening, uh, Your Worship, members of the Council. I know it's a beginning a bit late. If you're in agreement, the presentation's a bit long. There's a lot of information in there for you. So I'll abbreviate the presentation because I think that you've uh, read your, you've all read your documentation as you as you uh, as you should have. So I see smiles here and there on the table. So uh, so we're starting on the right with the right tone. So this presentation is to provide to to suggest alternatives to the way um, advisory committees work to promote some discussion, some reflection around the table. Um, your you know that we have an order on how uh, advisory committees work, A4.1. Uh, a a so it may be, have to be modified to indicate how uh, we're operating in, the, operating in the future. This is what I'm proposed to you. Tonight, I'll give you a little brief history of uh, how we've come to this. 2009, I believe it was one of the first occasions where uh, it was a uh, the re revision of the the, com the committees uh, it was important a major one we tried to reposition the committees uh, what the most important thing we accomplished was that the municipality was able to clarify the alignment of the roles of these committees to establish that the that the uh, the, co the council's committee are answer to the uh, municipal council they're not separate they're there to help the council to do its work there was a repositioning of the councils uh, committees, rather. Uh, there were some committees clarified, and that's when we developed um, a new order on how those committees are to operate. In 2012, we also had an update. Uh, we re reviewed the order. We reviewed certain, maybe certain committees that were not necessary, different ways of handling uh, issues so that we revised these committees. So that leads to the committee that we currently have. As you see on the slide, we have the uh, uh, three types of committees, the standing committees, ad hoc committees, for example, democracy and participation created at the start of the mandate. And finally, we have uh, advisory committees. So there are four advisory committees, uh, accessibility, uh, equality of chances, of opportunities, environment, and, 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 and francophony. So these committees are created by and for the municipal council. They, they fall under you. Uh, there are communities within municipalities that op are operating separately. Um, some, uh, for example, there's a committee for seniors, uh, a youth action committee, um, a, a wellness strategy. There's a difference between those strategies, those committees, and, and the committee and the co and the council's committees. To is to whom they answer. In fact, they're created to have a commitment from the community, but f either for you or for the staff that are that handle certain uh, uh, files or responsibilities that's the distinction we, that can be made there drawn there so why uh, should we revise the structure we have to consider the current context the challenges we're facing um, we raise a few here um, we were certainly some challenge with quorum it's not because people it's not because people aren't interested there are people who are very committed they're very uh, um, uh, they have lots of things to do. Uh, it's not for lack of interest, but it's hard to get everybody around the table. Um, the other thing is, even if we've improved the process uh, substantially in terms of preparing the, the meetings, it's still a lot to follow when we have to cancel um, a meeting and, and, and reschedule it. There's a lot of logistics associated with that. Uh, during re re meetings often at night, as of 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, what we've come to realize is that... Uh, it's not great for everybody. Uh, if we're speaking of families in Dieppe with kids, uh, it's not obvious. So it's not always the best time to make, have those meetings. People working uh, uh, outside, uh, sometimes uh, it's hard to travel in wintertime. Uh, lots of challenges associated with this. Everything thing around these uh, co uh, councils, committees, uh, there's a limited number of citizens who can become involved. They're named by members of the council. So, for example, the ad hoc committee on uh, uh, participatory democracy, for the first time, the committee had to make difficult choices. Lots of people wanted to participate, uh, many more people uh, wanting to participate than there were places on the committee. Uh, that's an example. The experience that we, our experience was there that maybe the mandate is not entirely clear. So the problem that we have to resolve, that the, what does the council expect from those committees? So there's a, there are clarifications that's been made at that level. Because what we've also realized is 
as people, as we saw with the participatory budget and other situations, uh, the staff committees, people want to become involved. There are people who want to become uh, committed uh, to, 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 there's lots of, there's lots of engagement. It's just, it's to find the way to involve those people there. Quickly, in terms of uh, citizen participatory, uh, it's a larger sphere of participation. So if you, here's a d definition, if you will, of uh, International Association for Public Participation. What you have to retain from this definition is that public participation of a citizen partic participation is there when there's a decision to take or, uh, or, this, or uh, a problem to solve or a decision to, to make. We don't commit people, we don't engage people because we want to communicate something to them. That's, an, that's something else entirely. If there's a decision to make, a problem to solve, uh, that's when uh, public uh, citizen participation is involved. There's lots of uh, values and principles that can be followed. We have a policy. We have a policy on uh, public on citizen participation in Dieppe. So this is the role of the, the ta of the city in terms of participation. What we're offering here is, is our role is as a catalyst uh, for that dialogue. Uh, uh, the type of vision that we have is that the 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 city promotes respect uh, res, uh, respectful dialogue uh, based on what the subjects that people that touch people in fact that they will can participate in by the at the time and means that they that what they would like to ha to that what they would like and that are chosen by the individuals who chooses to be to come engage with the municipality. It's, this is the type of our vision of of how we'd like to see things happen. So I mentioned values and principles. I will, I won't go them over them. You'll have the opportunity to see them. It's what's important to remember is that values are there to guide us. They're there to orient our actions, the actions that we will take. And there are seven. Um, and afterwards, the principles are. It's the same idea. The rules, in fact, that the rules we have to follow. These are non-negotiable that govern citizen participation in Dieppe. So those are the, that's the foundation of any uh, citizen, particip citizen participation uh, exercise that we want to take up in Dieppe uh, to do it properly. There's a call for tenders. We, we do our, our, what we can to uh, our best of, to follow that. There's the same thing has to happen with citizen participation. An evolution, a change has to happen within the staff. Uh, uh, we're open to it, but we have to learn things like any other municipality. So you see the 10 principles up there. You have received the documentation. If you want to read it a little more about it, you can uh, you can read our policy. So the major question is is our is our current uh, does does the current uh, structure uh, respect those values and principles? Most of the times, yes, but we can certainly improve on that situation. One of the things we we hear about possible possible improvements. Could we please clarify questions and decisions to be to be made? We decided to create a committee. We have to be clear on those questions. Uh, to make, how could we could make participation more accessible to people? How could we involve a larger number of residents? Um, maybe to seek offering different platforms for participation, uh, a justified engagement pr platforms, to see how we can promote access to information so, so they can properly participate so they can easily access that information. They shouldn't have to go through a website. Uh, they should just um, easily be able to find the information on a file uh, uh, or a project. So c current trends in the MISPO world, I sent you um, 10, uh, 10, 10, 10 pro uh, things. Uh, some of them are for larger larger towns. Uh, I'll show you uh, St. John's. It's a bit l larger than us, but but the people there consulted us a lot uh, in terms of uh, markets. Uh, they looked at us, uh, looked closely at us uh, when we started our participatory uh, policy. They went, they asked, they, they spoke with us, consulted with us, but they actually went beyond us now. I'm showing uh, their website to you on the sc on screen. The way that they work in committees. This is what uh, we're touch touching on here. It's a structure, it's a committee structure. They have a platform on their website. It called it. They call it Engage St. John's. When we click on on the uh, tab for Engage St. John's, we can see their platform. And that and that uh, really gets uh, 
uh, residents to, to get involved in different topics. We're talking about uh, uh, garbage cans, transportation, et cetera, right down the committees. So there's a platform for the uh, members of the committee. When they click on that, uh, the members, the councils, uh, committee councils, they, they, uh, there's a page where they can get in, find information on their committee. What we've uh, noted is that they have lots of different types of committees, and the people can go within that tool uh, and and sign in. It's a, through a login name. It's a closed platform at that point, but they've also, uh, as a planning tool, they they have some questions coming out of that committee to make them public, in fact. So the advantage uh, from what we can see here, that we have consulted with them too, it enables them to continu continue work uh, without always having face-to-face -face meetings. They do have face-to-face -face meetings, but they can continue the work in a closed uh, forum online to have debates on questions to consult each other in one single spot. They don't have to send emails here and there. Uh, we do this a bit, but uh, people are bombarded by emails, and it's, things are lost quite easily. That's an advantage that we found to their approach. They've been doing this uh, for over the past two years, and they're ready to renew the, the tool as well. Uh, another example of, of things that they're doing is the budget, for example. They have a, a consultation ongoing. Um, you can see the documents that they can insert regarding the budget. They can ask questions to people. As simple as uh, what would they would like to see in the budget, for example. Uh, so it's easy to consult the, the, uh, the community regarding a budget. They also have a uh, road construction transportation study. Uh, what's interesting with this one is that we can find the, the localization aspect GP, by GPS, in fact. People can express themselves regarding a topic in the region, and they, they can see the specific area where uh, uh, things are being proposed. I uh, see the images as well to the right as well. Uh, another point that's interesting, uh, another subject, uh, different topics regarding garbage collection. Uh, as you can see, uh, you can see the right general information. It's kind of a one-stop shop for information. And there's different components where we can uh, find information on different activities going on. Um, to the right, we see the cycle of the uh, citizen participation uh, exercise. It's open. Uh, it's an open uh, planning. Uh, but they can change it later, depending on the phases are clear. The people can follow where that the citizen particip participation exercise uh, where it is in, in terms of its uh, life path, in terms of the uh, garbage. Uh, uh, they can even ask specific questions. I think they will uh, provide recycling uh, uh, bins or, or garbage bins. Uh, what do you want? Would you want to prefer a certain size? Um, they have quick access to answers in terms of consulting people. And finally, a, la a final example of what that tool enables. It's a question and answer. So there we see a bit like you might see on Facebook, but it's specific here to this project. Um, so we see some questions and answers, uh, uh, and people can, and can follow it. And this follow this applies to our uh, our, uh, our council committees. This is a tool that it could be part of our larger part of our uh, citizen participation strategy. Um, and I'm going back to my presentation, my PowerPoint presentation. I will now speak to the, about the tools. I also submitted a list of tools to show you that there's lots of things that exist on the market. There's new tools uh, coming up every month. There's three main ones, though, uh, three leaders in the area uh, for Canadian municipalities. I'm part of a network, a uh, pan-Canadian network, uh, for citizen particip participa participation in, in uh, municipalities. And a lot of those municipalities are using those three types of tools. So what I'm trying to, to bring about here is uh, what do we want to do with these committee councils? Is there a, an opportunity here? 
uh, we have an opportunity to, to establish a more modern structure than we ha currently have that will allow for a, a better engagement, a larger number of citizens so that they can help us to contribute to municipal decisions because uh, we want them to become involved. Where we want them to become involved. Uh, we, there's context to be made here. I, examples in Calgary, let's not, we can't only compare it to Calgary, but we, but some of them, there's are smaller municipalities like St. John's or Halifax that are involved. We have to understand that Dieppe, uh, the community of Dieppe, um, the suggestions uh, that I'm uh, providing to you tonight. Uh, we spoke to you uh, briefly uh, to the direction uh, management team. Uh, we don't want to eliminate face-to-face -face meetings. It's important, but we should look at maybe at citizen forums. Mr. Melanson, uh, general manager, was saying it, it did exist in in Dieppe. Uh, maybe we're going back to something that existed before. Um, we could we could it could be based on the seasons. Uh, citizen forum where people are invited uh, to participate and uh, with online panels uh, the tool that we show that I showed you earlier perhaps uh, uh, the people who can't make their make their way over there they can still contribute to the dialogue and discussion to advance a, a, a file so uh, online platforms web platforms we could could see a project pilot we could look at uh, developing a project pilot um, citizen forums I've sent you some links as well Small videos that explains how it works. Uh, an open citizen forum. I hope that you have a chance to look at them. It lasts about two or three minutes. Uh, basically, a, a, uh, it's an open forum. Uh, uh, as people choose to come, they choose the questions that will be decided. Uh, for ex an example of an open forum tonight, the theme, the overall theme is environment, uh, speaking of accessibility or, or, or francophonie. And specific questions are maybe not determined in advance. So people come and people are there, uh, they're, 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 they're there, they're establishing groups, that this, this, the topics they want to touch upon. So they have champions, so the champions proposes a, a subject and, and then decide, the people there decide where they want to go and they have debates. It's a different type of forum but it enables people to have dialogue, to create links. Um, uh, the, this basically, that's the idea. We could, we could see, foresee doing that here, but it's also part of the face-to-face -face aspect, uh, and backed up by uh, an online platform. The next step, I imagine there'll be some questions perhaps, uh, what I would, propose uh, with the general manager is to consult the act current members of our uh, advisory committees. It'd be interesting to see what they think of this con of different concepts and what their perspective uh, around it is. Uh, when we were preparing this, uh, we still had an ad hoc committee uh, that, that was uh, inactive, but we, we could have sent the, 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 the question perhaps. Uh, and we'd like to see if you're open to uh, this type of approach, and then we can explore further explore the details, the tools, in more concrete ways. There's lots of things to consider uh, if we go towards citizen forums backed by uh, a web platform. Lots of components to consider. So that's pretty much what I wanted to uh, present to you rather quickly. I don't know if you have any questions or comments. So, uh, question, comment? Mr. Gadet, uh, just a comment. Uh, when I, um, I've talked to two or three people uh, in terms of participation, uh, there's a lot of people, uh, well, those people commented they, they know when it's going to start, but they don't know it's going to end. So it's like a commitment that's not well defined. And if it was two or three meetings and that's it, uh, every Saturday afternoon we'll discuss a such and such a subject. If they're interested, they'll get on. But difficulty to approach the person and convince him or her, say, well, it's committee. Yes, it's interesting, but you know I don't want to commit myself for a year or two on this. Uh, you know, short term, with 
very specific subjects, uh, topics, there would be an interest. And in. I've even been approached and say, there are things can I do September, October, because I'm away for winter. Is there anything I can help uh, the city? So that exists. Uh, any others, uh, Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 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 same thing, I have young people that live in the EP uh, during the school year and they come back, uh, go back to uh, home uh, during the summer season or in, in Christmas. So to commit themselves, to commit something that's longer term, uh, uh, if it's something in the short term, uh, they might discuss, you know, like Saturday afternoon, do something in public safety. Um, on the imaginary festival or whatever. Uh, uh, so I think that would be uh, much more, res it would be more receptive on the part of citizens to look at something online. I think uh, definitely the answer uh, to access more people and maybe open up again the, the the bylaw and decide what we want to. I mean, we're 2017. We have to get with the times. So, thank you, uh, Councillor Leblanc. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think Mr. Duchard is right. It's not a lack of will uh, for committees as we are now. Uh, we we find ourselves in community. community which is young, vibrant, uh, family-oriented, but all kinds of professionals and their uh, responsibilities. So to commit to a committee that's gonna meet every two, three weeks a month, uh, you, you know, you know, 100 to meet number six to eight people, you know, even to have quorum. There must be a way to find some way to reach each other, you know, whether it's Skype or uh, an open forum. Often the, the families can take part, but they can't uh, move, uh, you know, you know, maybe electronically, uh, we might uh, get a bigger success uh, to reach uh, more people. So it might be uh, good to look into this. Uh, so uh, we might want to uh, consult some of the people that are already involved in this and what, what their opinions are. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Lam, Mr. Bidido. So thank you, well, by experience, uh, a committee that we worked on quite a bit, Mr. Deshaun, you were there, and you were there at every meeting. The big problem was basically quorum, that was hard to establish, and had a nice committee, excellent people, uh, committed volunteers who wanted to be there, had good ideas, they were ready, but at some point it exploded. There were too many good ideas and at some point, it's like we were not getting anywhere because they would tell me, well, what are we gonna do? Uh, we might have deviated from the main, the advisory mandate, uh, you know, by becoming proactive. So I found that difficult, uh, you know, for, for my, uh, there for a two-year mandate. Well, you can't continue to work on it because it's on to another counselor and uh, he's going to have a skate around uh, as well to, you know, to get started again. So that's the unease that I felt. I, I felt there was a lot of work that we could have done with the committee, uh, but we might not have properly defined the basis where we wanted to go with this, uh, how far, w how much we could have developed the ideas, um, you know, consulted with other people. We had uh, some good uh, people. We had uh, 
some very good people, some very good discussions. Uh, but at some point it was it got difficult. Uh, thank you. I didn't uh, plan to intervene, but I agree. We're developing new ways of reaching uh, citizens. But also, if I look at the Seniors Committee, Dieppe, the which is not an advisory committee, maybe it should be. We have 80 to 90% participation because people are retired. But face-to-face -face for that committee is very important for them. That's my two cents. I, I uh, support the idea of Ted uh, when there's an important issue and people want to get involved. So what you do right now, I think it's very good. It's great, you know, provincial, federal, maybe if there's animosity, uh, but at the municipal level, we look for solutions together. So what uh, I bring up today, it's something we have to work on to reflect on uh, but it's uh, right on when some people, when things are important, people are ready. And I think it's important that the mix that you propose, I think you're on the right path. Uh, I am impressed uh, to see what other cities have done. And as Jean-Claude says, uh, we have people, uh, the retired people that are ready to get involved. Uh, and they're ready, uh, you know, ready in different ways, uh, but no need to meet face to face. Others prefer uh, electronically. Uh, Probably it's often the same people, traditionally. Uh, right now, with what you propose, it'll bring back uh, new faces. Uh, good work. Thank you. So if uh, I'll uh, put in my two cents as well. I think it's interesting to hear that uh, back to the future I remember what we did. Uh, it's usually were municipal meetings in each uh, in each uh, uh, riding, so they knew there were discussions. Uh, in specifically, if they were one thing, it always came out of it, uh, you know, with themes uh, that would apply to the whole municipality. So. Uh, so I think we have to keep all. The doors open all possibilities of discussion with our citizens, uh, whether it's town hall, that form format to invite people on one topic, uh, whether it's uh, intervene uh, in terms of social media. Uh, internet meetings, whatever. I think the important is to keep a link, uh, maintain that link. Uh, there's no bad formula. I, I think that's the uh, the discussion. There's no bad means for some people. It's face to face. I I read the newspaper on the internet, uh, but she won't. My wife won't do it. She has to touch, to hold it in her hand. So he, to uh, you know each to each his own, uh, as long as we move ahead and we help me in respecty to go forth. Uh, so I don't know if from the comments you got this evening, if it helps you to put all of this, uh, shake this in one bag and pick at it, uh, pick it out again. I think that's what we're seeing, but there's no, essentially no bad way to involve people. Each people will find their, their level of comfort. Uh, so thank you. Maybe to add, uh, this forum is your forum uh, to dialogue, to listen, to exchange with the citizens. So this bylaw is belongs to you. So we find we want to find ways that you're comfortable to work within uh, process or uh, 
mechanism. So we'll continue to reflect on this. We may come back uh, with, uh, f with moving further on this issue. So it is your forum to speak to our citizens and uh, so, thank you. Uh, update uh, the objectives uh, on the strategic plan, so E11 and E12. Uh, that'll be quick in terms of, uh, we come back uh, to give you an update on the strategic plan being the uh, champion on the particip citizen participation. Right now, E1, we want to increase the participation of residents in decision making. We've, we've talked about uh, budget, participatory budget uh, and committees uh, for that objective. Uh, what comes out of uh, the strategy is to pursue the implementation of an action plan on the citizens' participation and to update on, on uh, progress on an annual basis. Uh, so within the 2016, uh, you will see on the screen some of the things that we've been able to do. You know, uh, raising awareness, internal training. We have other projects as well that we hope to do. Another project that we did with the community was part of municipal election. We had done a votes, uh, vote simulation project uh, uh, with uh, teachers and students at the Cap Four de la Cadie. So they either voted for you or your adversaries. They did the simulation, but they were able to live that experience uh, with uh, preparing them to vote. Uh, So 20, uh, the action plan for 27, uh, 2019. So this is renewed for the next two years. Uh, so uh, perhaps a web platform, and I've I mentioned 11 actions there. Other things uh, that come out of it, but that, these are some of the actions for eject, objective one, uh, E12, we want to offer annually. Uh, and six occasions for the committee to take part in municipal decision making. And in terms of the respect, the intention of principles of the municipal policy of uh, having a public participation. As you can see, three columns. These are columns of our continuum. It's on the left, uh, the uh, one to consult. Uh, three items uh, 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 so involve the community uh, term to involve the community uh, but uh, but but budgetary participation so for 2017 and consulting with my colleagues around the table I said well what's coming we don't have uh, six identified, but often things uh, crop up, and uh, so we'll continue uh, on a daily basis to work on this to get to our six uh, annual ones. So that was a quick overview of where we are with our strategies, uh, with these two strategies, uh, uh, and there's uh, also resources. I think we, we are making progress. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, 